BAML commencing the stream for this 1st of October 2022. It's 9.28pm Melbourne time in Australia and uh, currently we're running with an extra webcam tonight um, to, prove that <laughs> to prove that this uh, title is not quite as sophisticated as it might be. It's simply a webcam pointing at a computer screen, as you might gather, uh, and I can hold up the, the most hated image in ham radio, which is one of these. Uh, <laughs> it was given to me by Peter VK3ACZ, and I'm very appreciative of the gift, even though it's uh, one of the most hated transmitters in ham radio, very handy for hiking for brief transmitting, not really for um, anything serious. I'll just check that I've got a stream, and I have. Um, so, with that said, it's uh, ticking over to 9.29, 9.30. And again, just to prove that we're live, give you the hand and the thumbs up. And we'll, on that uh, screen later tonight, we'll see the Zoom transmission. Uh, in the meantime, um, I'll switch to live cam just as 9.30 ticks over and um, I'll switch on the transmitter on 147.475. This is VK3AML. With the time at 9.30, this is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima and uh, just putting on the live webcam. Uh, if you care to look in on the video of this, uh, please Google VK3 AML 1 October 2022 and uh, you'll see the uh, video accompaniment to this um, Transmission on 147.475 in Melbourne. Um, we're currently live streaming on YouTube, which we do every Saturday night, with material I hope of interest to radio hams and shortwave listeners, as well as those on the net watching. Um, subject of this evening's transmission will be glass. The manufacture of glass, the usage of glass for communications, um, here is, for example, one usage of it. That's probably the most famous valve of all time, the 807, an output tube that was introduced in 1934. I think it was the first of the beam pentode tubes. And uh, this, its smaller brother, is the Type 6L6, which is more commonly used in high output push-pull uh, valve audio amplifiers in days of yore. But I realised how little I knew about glass so I decided to assemble a series of uh, documentaries made in the distant past and in some cases in the nearer past on the manufacture of glass for scientific purposes, for optical purposes and for art, which we'll see tonight. But first, it's uh, my very sad task, my very sad duty, to announce um, the passing of one of the regular members of our Saturday night Zoom and uh, Channel D crew. And that's uh, the late Gary Cook, VK3GLC, who was last seen as recently as last Saturday on our Zoom uh, feedback line. And uh, it's my melancholy task to announce that he had heart failure only a few hours after the conclusion of our Zoom at uh, midnight last Saturday night and uh, stayed alive on life support until Thursday the 29th of September when life support was turned off and uh, uh, Gary was generous to the end. He was an organ donor and his kidneys 
being donated to somebody who desperately needs a kidney transplant. I'll do a little bit of a, an obit on uh, Gary. This is Gary in his early days in Adelaide uh, as a primary school kid. He uh, pursued a career in telecommunications, trained himself in that area, was also into 6 metres DX in Adelaide. Here he is up one of Telstra's towers in Adelaide. Moved to Melbourne to continue his career and uh, this is where of course I, I knew him. Um, there he is with his favourite rottweiler and uh, this is a hobby that not too many people would be aware of Gary climbing into a glider he actually did a bit of uh, gliding and uh, aviation of which not too many people are aware is Gary in 2010 and this is Gary with his other hobby his Triumph motorcycle uh, of which he was justly proud and he'd drive around mostly for uh, pleasure and this is a photo I took only a few months ago when Gary came up on the Triumph to join us at our field day on One Tree Hill when Peter VK3ACZ and Tom 3FTOM and I were occupying one of the stone shelters up at uh, One Tree Hill and he came up to join us to partake of the transmissions there he is in his uh, motorcycling gear Peter on the left and Peter's wife Sandra on the right and uh, this <laughs> this is one of the ways I'll always remember um, Gary um, I call this the Laurel and Hardy picture uh, Peter 3ACZ inadvertently doing a very good imitation of Stan Laurel and and Gary doing a very good imitation of Oliver Hardy uh, indignance um, one of the nicest of people, Gary, that one could hope to meet. Uh, very quiet chap, very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about uh, telecommunications matters. Born in England about 1962, came to Australia in 1964. He went to Thorndon High School in the northeast suburbs of Adelaide, worked at various jobs, and finally studied uh, network. Uh, as a network specialist for Telstra and in IT consultancy with a long part-time course at Regency TAFE in Adelaide. Uh, then to Melbourne about a decade back and this is the way we'll always remember Gary. VK3 GLC, originally VK5 ZGC who sadly passed away last Sunday. Or rather had a a heart failure last Sunday and passed away Thursday. Gary VK3 GLC, the first of our group to go, sadly, and um, our sympathies go to his partner Sam. Um, I don't think I've met you, Sam, but if you ever see this, um, we had the highest respect for Gary on every possible level. He was a quiet achiever, and I mean quiet. He would uh, very seldom come out with accounts of his uh, background in telecommunications unless you pried it from him. And when you did, you got very interesting material. He was an interesting character, but uh, played his cards close to his chest. I'm very privileged to have known him. Gary Cook, VK3 GLC, sadly passed. This is VK3 AML. Just repeating the announcement that I made when I came on, 147.475, if you want to look in on the transmissions here, um, please Google the phrase VK3AML 1 October 2022. That's Google the phrase VK3AML 1 October 2022, and that will take you to uh, the video stream as we do each week on YouTube live stream running concurrently with the transmissions on 147.475 OK, over to the subject in hand our first film of the night made in 1942 is a film called Looking Through Glass Looking Through Glass 
by courtesy of the British Council, we acquired uh, access to this film. And it's on glass manufacturer for scientific and artistic purposes. We'll move on to the scientific purposes with the next film. In the meantime, Looking Through Glass, 1942. from the raw materials, glass becomes molten and flows like syrup, getting stiffer continuously as it cools. Upon these facts depend the whole practice of the craftsman and technician in glassmaking. In the case of the craftsman, the making of glass demonstrates what a wonderful thing the human hand can be, flexible, strong and extremely sensitive. The air bubble is the foundation on which most of the craftsman's work is based. Although machinery plays a big part these days, the craftsman, using his simple traditional tools, is still indispensable for the manufacture of special orders, too small perhaps to warrant the setting up of expensive machinery. The craftsman is also the source of most of the beautiful in glass. Beauty in glass is best expressed in lovely forms. However, simplicity in decoration can add considerably to its charm. The great beauty of glass 
is its translucence and color. Decoration can be obtained by cutting, etching, sandblasting, and by the mixing of these methods. The craftsman can change quickly from one task to another, requiring only his few tools and a wealth of experience. The white section of this lump of molten glass must be in exactly the right place, as it is to be the opaque backing in the hundred feet of thermometer tubing these men will draw by hand. And the small air bubble must also be in the right position, as it becomes the passage in the thermometer. When the mass of molten glass is placed on the post, or rod, the join is made firm by cooling it rapidly with cold water. As the tubing is drawn out, it is revolved on the instructions of the craftsman. This revolving is necessary to prevent the weight of the tube causing the lump to sag out of the tube. The longer the tube gets, the more often they have to turn it over. It's really quite simple. Just a lump of molten glass, an iron tube, an iron rod, and about 10 years training. Here is another side of the industry which does not change, the craft of the pot maker. The pots made of a special clay have to be able to stand a furnace heat of 1500 degrees centigrade. The body of the pot must be uniform and well knitted and the inner surface perfectly smooth. Any irregularity would eventually break off under the drag of the glass and spoil it. The mixture of sand, soda and lime from which plate glass is made is heated in furnaces to a tremendous temperature until the raw materials in the pots slowly fuse and become ready to pour. incredible that these clay pots brought to a white heat can hold safely well over a ton of molten glass while being transported and tilted in the process. has become a sheet of plate glass and goes into the cooling chamber. The process is carried out under scientific control developed through years of unremitting research. This is only one of the many problems glass research men have overcome. In the Department of Glass Technology at Sheffield University, Britain possesses a splendid research foundation supported by British and Dominion glass manufacturers and the university authorities. The originator of the department, which was the pioneer of its kind in the world, is Professor Turner, to whom tribute is paid by glassmakers all over the world. Students come here from many countries. In these well-equipped laboratories, the problems of glass are studied scientifically, and the results quickly conveyed to manufacturers through visits of Professor Turner and his staff, and through the Society of Glass Technology, a pioneer body with membership throughout the world. Here, a specially heat-treated safety glass windscreen is being tested. First, a bending test for pliability. Then the safety glass is tested for resistance to smashing by dropping a metal ball on it from a height of eight feet. This it easily withstands. The height is increased until the ball, dropping from 12 feet, smashes the glass which then collapses into harmless, many-sided grains having no cutting edges at all. Britain manufactures glass jars and bottles on a very large scale. Here we see a pressure test on bottles sent in by the manufacturers. Products are regularly tested at the works. The laboratories at Sheffield make control tests and report back to the manufacturers. 
The purity of the raw materials is also carefully checked by chemical analysis. Sand must be tested to ensure that it can be made suitable for the manufacture of fine glass. Britain has many deposits of sand, one of them as pure as any in Europe. She is the first country in the world to have carried out the purification of sand on a large scale by chemical washing. continuous rolling process, the sand, lime and soda ash, after careful mixing, are fed into the giant tank furnace. The train man rings a bell to warn the engineers controlling the flow of molten glass of the impending disturbance and rise in level when the raw materials are fed in. The raw materials, three tons of them, pour down from the hopper, filling up the mouth of the tank. continuous rolling of plate glass is a modern miracle. The molten glass flows into the rollers and is drawn between them at the rate of about a yard a minute. Still in a semi-molten state, the glass, now recognizable as red-hot plate glass, is carried on through other rolls into the annealing chamber, several hundred feet in length, where its cooling rate is controlled so that it sets without cracking or splintering. On emerging from the annealing chamber, cold and firm, it is cut by hand to the required length. A diamond point is used. As the cut in the glass plate passes over a special roller, leverage is applied to it by rotating the roller and the plate is neatly severed through. The section of plate glass is then seized by a pneumatic grab which uses suction pads. These adhere firmly to the surface of the glass and carry a glass plate weighing anything up to half a ton quite safely. In this instance, it is carried to the grinding and polishing line. The plate glass is lowered, slowly and carefully, onto a moving belt, to which it is secured by pegs and wedges, and is then passed under the grinders. A mixture of sand and water is flooded onto the glass under the flat teeth of the grinder heads, which grind away the irregularities. Then it passes on to the polishers, which circle and swing like a circus sideshow, buffing and polishing the glass with polishing room. The plate glass, having now been ground and polished until the surface is smooth and faultless on both sides, is freed from the conveyor and, strong and transparent, is carried off by a pneumatic grab ready for service. Day and night, mile after mile of glass, over 100 inches wide from just one production line. Commercial glass is manufactured in vast quantities in Great Britain for many different purposes. Glass for scientific research. Glass essential for electrical and chemical uses, for acid line taps. Glass wool and glass cloth for all types of insulation. Bulletproof shields for fighter planes lamp covers and lamp bulbs, all glass hypodermic syringes and tubes for the manufacture of synthetic fabrics and so on. Glass technicians have evolved machinery to reproduce the art of the craftsman, as in the drawing of glass tubing, or again as in the making of glass bricks, where the blob of molten glass is cut off, pressed in a mold at great heat, cooled rapidly under an air jet. While still pliable, it is taken for a final trim, and then the two halves of a brick are hermetically sealed together, producing a translucent glass brick with excellent properties for insulating heat and sun. Glass bricks, a significant highlight on the architecture of the future. Machines mold glass and machines blow glass. And sometimes they do both imitating exactly the movements of the craftsman. 
And in early type machines, even the length of the punties, which swing and spin on these machines, making electric bulbs and radio bulbs. progresses, the punties are shortened and are increased in number so that four gathers of glass are made at one time. Mechanical power and man's inventive genius have produced these amazing machines. Machines also make bottles of many sizes and varied shapes. One remarkable thing in these particular machines is that the pot containing the molten glass is constantly revolved, keeping a steady supply of glass for the rapidly moving punties to gather. The gathering mechanism picks up the required quantity of molten glass, then, while the mold empties the bottles previously made, the gathering mechanism opens up, revealing an elongated glass bubble. Up comes the empty mold and then closes the glass bubble and the process goes on. This film which demonstrates the important position that Britain holds in the production of glass, was photographed through a perfectly balanced British lens of a type famous throughout the world. Through it, we see the means to supply so many needs of war, means which we will turn to meet the needs of peace and progress. So Britain makes glass. Glass to invite the sunlight into her home into her factories, and into her school. Looking through glass, we see a brighter future. has been called a scientific animal. So far as we know, he is the only living creature that wants to explore and comprehend the entire universe. During the last few centuries, his scientific curiosity has increased until it can no longer be satisfied by his unaided senses. In order to see always farther and more exactly, he has constructed new eyes which extend the range and acuity of his vision out of all proportion to its original powers. There are literally hundreds of kinds of these new eyes. They range from the telescope which reveals universes millions of miles away, to the microscope, which can reveal structures so infinitesimal that today the limit of resolving power is set by the actual coarseness of waves of light. Optical instruments would be helpless without light, but then, without sunlight, life itself would quickly disappear. These light rays from the sun have traveled 92 million miles in about eight minutes, and in very nearly a straight line. But watch what happens to them when they encounter a block of glass. Some of the rays are dispersed, some absorbed, some reflected, and some are bent. The ability of glass and crystal to bend or refract light is the basis of the optical instrument. These triangular prisms bend light rays to form a definite angle, the angle bending on the density of the glass. Right angle prisms make light travel round corners. The base of the prism acts as a very efficient mirror and almost no light is lost, even when several prisms are used. Each ray follows a separate path. All these prisms are to be used in one instrument. First, they must be cemented together. They now form the main prism of the military range finder used in aiming artillery pieces. If two prisms are placed apex to apex, the light rays are spread apart. Now substitute for the prisms a double concave lens. Lenses are really prisms, but with curved surfaces. 
Remove the lens and the light rays straighten. A convex lens or burning glass brings light rays to a focus. In a microscope, each lens increases the magnification produced by the preceding lens until the combined system is capable of magnifying several thousand times. The most important part of any camera is its lens. Rays of light reflected from the scene are caught by the lens and brought to a focus so as to form an image. Here is the image of the sitter focused on the ground glass of the camera upside down. When the inverted image on a motion picture film is thrown back through the lens of the cinema projector, it appears right side up on the theater screen. Glass for precision lenses is made at the plant of the Bausch & Lomb Optical Company, the only commercial optical glass plant in America. The ingredients of glass are sand, soda, potash and lime. Other minerals such as barium and lead sometimes are added. The materials are loaded into the already heated melting pot through a small door in the furnace to avoid lowering the temperature. With the aid of an optical pyrometer, the heat of the furnace is maintained at 2600 degrees Fahrenheit. The melted glass is constantly agitated by a water-cooled stirring rod having a tip of fire clay. A long-handled ladle is used from time to time to take a sample of glass, much as a cook would take a sample of soup, to see how the melting and stirring has progressed. The inspector now looks the sample over for bubbles or unmelted material. When a perfect sample shows that the glass is ready, the white-hot tip of the stirring rod is removed. A truck equipped with enormous tongs is wheeled in and the door of the furnace is raised. The heat from the open door is blistering and the men keep away from it. The truck is tilted until the tongs are well below the rim of the pot. And then the jaws are closed, grasping the pot firmly. Nobody wants it to fall at this stage, least of all the men near it. If this glass were to be used for spectacle lenses, the pot would now be swung on a crane, poured out on an iron table and rolled into a sheet. But as this glass is to be used in optical instruments, it is wheeled toward a pedestal of fire brick where it will be set down, covered, and allowed to cool slowly for four days. This slow cooling is very important as it prevents strains in the glass. Did you ever hear of a Prince Rupert's tear? This piece of glass was not cooled slowly, but was dropped molten into oil, causing terrific strain. The head will stand hammering, but watch what happens when the long, slim tail is broken. Now the same thing under water. Strain is avoided in glass by slow cooling or annealing. The whole melt is now broken up, and not with a toothpick. The glass breaks into large, clear pieces. These are carefully inspected for flaws and strain, only about one-third of the total contents of the pot passing inspection. These pieces of glass, molded to the shape of lenses and prisms, are now ready to be ground and polished. Grinding gives them exactly the right surface, and polishing makes them transparent. First, the rough pressings are cemented to a blocking shell, the number to a shell depending on the lens curvature. Tiny microscope lenses must be blocked separately. They are the smallest and also the most powerful lenses made. These condenser lenses are blocked in threes. When all are in position, a special mold presses them into the pitch. The grinding shell fits over the blocked lenses and grinds them to the exact curvature required. A combined rotating and rocking motion ensures even grinding at all points. Emery mixed with water is the abrasive used. As the grinding progresses, the grade of emery is changed from coarse to very fine. In polishing, emery is replaced with rouge, which is a refined iron rust, bright red in color. Both grinding and polishing may be done partly by hand or entirely by machinery. <laughs> Precision lens surfaces are tested after polishing by fitting them to a test glass of known accuracy. This test will measure a surface to within six one millionth of an inch, half a wavelength of light. 
The exactness of fit is indicated by the number and shape of the Newton's rings produced by interference of light between the surfaces. The earliest microscopes consisted of a single lens mounted in a metal plate. A wooden frame was good enough to support the rough lenses of 1800, but modern microscopes are so powerful that they require the best of mechanical precision. The machine work on the metal parts of the modern optical instrument is the most accurate known. Some machines use diamond pointed tools which cut highly polished surfaces on brass and aluminum. These tools can repeat an operation thousands of times without varying the cut a hairbreadth. In none of the more delicate machine work is a variation of more than two microns allowed. In transportation and industry, the optical instrument ensures the safety of materials. Waterfalls supply power, and power helps in making the steel of bridges on which thousands of people travel fearlessly. Our bridges and railroads are safer because the steel of which they are built has been examined by modern industrial microscopes. This is the surest method, by the way, of testing the reliability of metals before they are used. In the great industrial plants, the metallurgical expert is a very important factor. Gears and screw threads are tested for accuracy by an instrument called the contour projector. A much enlarged profile of the gears is thrown on a screen so as to reveal clearly the smallest effect. In order to test the stresses that building materials must undergo, engineers cut celluloid to resemble metal joints and stretch them with a weight. A beam of polarized light projects the image of the joint on a screen, revealing the strained areas and enabling the correction of faulty design. Turning the analyzer brings out the strained areas even more clearly. Modern medicine probably owes more to the microscope than to any other instrument. Almost every case of severe illness requires the use of the microscope not once, but many times to ensure proper diagnosis. In health bureaus, the microscope helps in the identification of disease germs and the control of epidemics. The cause of most diseases would still be unknown if the microscope had not proved that germs exist. A drop of the culture is placed under the microscope. With dark field illumination, the deadly typhoid bacilli are seen enlarged to 1,500 diameters. Here you see under the microscope life in its prenatal state. This chick embryo is only 48 hours old. The heart has already begun to beat and the blood is moving through the body. This view of blood circulating in a tadpole's tail shows how the cells stream through the capillary vessels. These are red corpuscles carrying oxygen to the tissues. The function of the white corpuscles is to protect the body from infection. Two cells near the center of the field have just split from a single parent and are still struggling to break apart. These giant scavengers of the blood were photographed in a tissue culture at one of the great research laboratories. Discoveries of biological science in the next few years may well revolutionize all our theories about sex, birth, and death, and give the human race a control over its destiny which would seem unbelievable today. In this new work, the optical instrument cannot fail to have a tremendously important share. And our thanks to the George Eastman Museum for the usage of uh, that particular clip. This is VK3AML, and currently we're doing uh, a night session on the subject of glass. Glass for valves, glass for insulation, um, all sorts of applications of glass, and uh, I thought it would be illuminating, if you'll pardon the pun, to have a, a night on uh, optical instruments, glass, and its production. Um, if you care, if you're listening on 147.475, please do Google the phrase VK3AML. 
1 October 2022 that's VK3 AML 1 October 2022 and you'll get the video stream that goes with this um, with this particular um, transmission on 147.475 and this is VK3 AML with the regular weekly test um, I will skip forward now to another documentary by the British Council made in wartime surprisingly shot in Technicolor um, not too much was shot in colour during the war all sorts of reasons for that um, there were wartime shortages of course the number of Technicolor cameras that could be produced with the three strip Technicolor three separate images one for red one for blue one for green uh, was very limited but for the war effort um, anything was available so this is a documentary called let's see made in britain probably during the blitz and uh, shows the acceleration of scientific glass making during the second world war let's see When the camera was invented, it became possible to obtain a photographic record of almost everything of scientific value, or human interest, through the lens. To most of us, a lens is a thing of glass, with mysterious properties that somehow makes it possible for us to record our progress through the years, our weddings and sporting events, and the major and minor incidents of the times in which we live. But in truth, the lens is a thing of beauty, an accessory to the human eye, and the making of lenses is a science out of which has grown the optical industry. To excel is to prosper. In no other industry does this apply more aptly than in the optical industry, where skill in craftsmanship is of the highest importance. All lenses and prisms have one thing in common. They are made of glass. It's the quality of this glass and its chemical composition that are important. Optical instruments are produced from a welter of figures. It often takes as much as a year to complete the data and mathematical calculations necessary for the making and arranging of a set of lenses in an instrument, to give it the required properties necessary to perform its particular job. Mounted in various ways, lenses may help to follow a favourite horse to the winning post. To photograph a pretty girl on the river. To navigate a ship at sea. Or serve a hundred other uses. The products of this industry are used in war as in peace. Binoculars scan the horizon. The aerial camera reveals secrets that camouflage has endeavoured to conceal. And the rangefinder makes marksmanship an exact science. The optometer tests the eyes without fault, doing
doing away with old methods of trial and error. The toolmaker's microscope is just as accurate in finding faults in the manufacture of an aircraft or a family car. As a result of the industry's contribution to the war effort, many technical advances have been made that will be of great value in the future. Optical glass is ground and polished to an incredible accuracy. Here, for example, is a lens surface being tested. Any unevenness of surface is magnified 40,000 times and compared with a finely tooled metal surface at the same magnification. The instrument that is used for the test is itself a product of the optical industry. If any unexpected developments are encountered during research work, every advantage is taken to put them to practical use. Out of this research, for instance, has emerged this thread cutting machine, used for the mounts of lenses and a host of other time-saving devices. Before the war, sand used in the optical industry in this country was imported from abroad. But today, that essential ingredient is mined from the highlands of Scotland. It is then purified and mixed with the other ingredients according to the formula. Pots made of fire clay that have taken three weeks to make are then left to dry for six months and preheated in electric furnaces. Then they are hoisted hydraulically into gas furnaces, after which they are filled with the mixture. This is done gradually to ensure even melting, the time factor being of greatest importance. Furnace temperature is taken at regular intervals. The pot is then lowered, much skill being needed to handle the white-hot container filled with molten glass. The temperature of the melt is taken again. Covered with a hood, it will now be allowed to cool gradually. When cold, the part is broken away, disclosing a mass of solid glass. This, in turn, is broken, shattering naturally along its lines of cleavage. From this mass, pieces are selected for size and perfection. The chosen pieces are subjected to further gradual heating. Then 
layer finally melted sufficiently to allow for molding into any of the 2,000 or more sizes and shapes now in use in the industry. After the final stage of annealing, the moulds enter their process of refinement. With the help of machines designed especially for this work, the pieces are ground and beveled preparatory to smoothing and polishing. This applies particularly to prisms, which because of their shape require special attention. The pieces are then individually set in pitch. Now they are placed on metal laps in such a way that the proper curve is consistently held. Roughing, smoothing and polishing are operations necessary to all forms of optical glass. The pieces are worked to a millionth of an inch, which is the everyday standard of measurement here. The process is carried on amid a symphony of sound and movement and colour as the polishers rotate against the surface of the protesting glass. Where lenses are set in pitch, prisms are embedded in plaster of Paris. But beyond this, the process is the same. progresses, more and more attention is paid to cleanliness and accuracy. The lens has been centered and now it is to be edged. It's hand polished for the last time and then tested. This is done visually at first by the reflection of light waves from two surfaces. In more exacting work, the interferometer is used, giving an accuracy of one millionth of an inch. Representing as they do an inaccuracy of one fifty thousandth of an inch, the disappearance of these rings indicates a perfect surface. When pronounced satisfactory, the lenses are cemented together to form components for rangefinder, binocular or whatever it may be. This cementing is done with balsam gum and much care is taken that no particle of dust should find its way between the component parts. After a period of baking, the components will be mounted, the mounts being the frame on which the glass optics are set at the exact angles and distances from each other that is demanded by the mathematical formula. When mounted, the lens may go either to project films or to make films in various parts of the world. Few people know that most Hollywood productions are photographed through lenses made in Britain. The camera is the mechanism which drives the film intermittently past the lens, the lens mount being set at a precise distance from the film. 
The amount of light penetrating through a lens is called the F value and is expressed by a number. One of the optical industry's newest developments is the coating of lenses with a special preparation to reduce loss of light by reflection from 10% to less than 1.5%. This serves to increase the F value by that amount. This coating process, which we see in operation here, is used, for example, in making night binoculars for our seamen. During the war, a shortage of binoculars was overcome by the nearest approach to mass production yet applied anywhere in the industry. Prisms and lenses were set in frames by machines erected at short notice. In this way, without losing any of its treasured accuracy, the industry was able to accelerate the production of a much-needed instrument. In peacetime, human endeavour turns to things constructive, and the British optical industry reflects in its own fine products the determination to supply none but the best, optical micrometers. Survey and meteorological instruments. Light testing instruments. Microscopes to aid in research, and telescopes to see into worlds unknown to us in the infinity of space. And that film by courtesy of the British Council, made during the war. Um, let's see, which is a survey of the optics industry, the glass optics industry in Britain at that time. Our progress was accelerated by wartime necessity. Now, those of you who know me know that I'm involved with optical communication experiments, modulated light communication experiments, and we use lenses too. Um, we have to use lenses of very large aperture, but they don't have to be fantastically accurate. They just have to be capable of collimating a point source to infinity. And for that purpose, when we did our records, um, including the recent linking of Tasmania and Victoria, we used these. They're Fresnel lenses. They're sold as magnifying sheets. Um, you'll see me holding one up if you're watching the... YouTube live stream, which incidentally you can find by googling VK3AML 1 October 2022 as a phrase. And I'm currently holding up um, uh, the one of the lenses we use to span Bass Strait with modulated light, which cost us all of, as you can see if you're watching the stream, $3.50. They're made of acrylic plastic acrylic, they're produced in mass-produced quantities like LP records, they're stamped out, uh, sold in a cellophane wrapper. I'll just open this partially because I won't get too much dust on it. But there is the Fresnel lens, I'll just pull it out for a moment and hold it up in front of my face and you'll see the, the magnifying effect there um, as you see. So in terms of uh, lenses of large aperture for collimating to a point source, not necessarily for getting good op optical images, Fresnel lenses can be a very good, inexpensive alternative to glass lenses, which in that diameter would cost, if you'll pardon the expression, a bloody fortune. This is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima with the regular Saturday night test currently doing um, the subject matter of glass, its usage for electronics, communications, optics, 
scientific glass. And uh, here's a particularly nice example of radio glassware, the Philips YL1150, which is a hefty beam tetrode um, capable of putting out the full uh, legal limit for AM. A fairly hefty uh, filament current required by this thing. It's a, a larger version of a better known tube from the 1950s called the Philips QQ EO640 and that's this little tube. Um, has two separate plate connections. The unfortunate thing with this particular design is if you over drove them or uh, over dissipated them the um, an anodes would fort <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> desolder themselves and drop off to the bottom of the tube. So these were the VHF workhorse PA valves of their time, their time being the late 50s and 1960s. These days, of course, replaced by solid state technology. But aren't these, aren't these just a beautiful example of um, glass technology? The, even the, um, the glass to metal seals there, I don't know whether I can get this into focus. There we go. Um, quite beautiful oxide apparently is applied to the metal on the pins and that oxide plus the metal chosen for the pins has to have the same coefficient of expansion as the glass envelope that uh, contains it so that when it heats up nothing cracks and you can imagine how many decades was required to uh, um, evolve all of that research and technology and fabrication anyway um, the time being 10 30 p.m. I thought we might have a change of um, pace for a moment and a little of the theatricality if I can put it that way of Julius Sumner Miller who I'm going to resurrect from the dead very justifiably with this 1969 television program on electrostatics which I'm sure will interest some people Ladies and gentlemen, and teachers, and boys and girls, and mothers and fathers, and people. I'm Julia Sumner Miller, and physics is my business. And our special business today, adventures with electric chargers. Adventures. Some wonderful things, really. Consider the following. Here is a slab of lucite. I've now handled it mm, abundantly. It is electrostatically neutral. Here is a metal plate on an insulating handle. It is electrostatically neutral. I lay the plate on the slab and I lift it and all I'm lifting is the weight of the plate. Now I'm going to do something. I'm going to do some work on this slab of lucite. I am slapping it with a fur. I have endowed that slab with some strange electric properties. Proof. I'm going to put the metal plate on the slab, and I'm going to put my finger on the upper surface of the metal plate, and then I'm going to lift the plate with ever so great a delicacy. A correction, a delicateness. Oh, it's very heavy. There are some electrostatic binding forces, Coulomb forces, we call them, and I'll show you that I have some electric energy in this metal plate or on it. Listen now. Ha-ha, <laughs> there was a discharge. There's a discharge. 
There is a discharge, and I continue, I can continue to take electric energy from this system forever, forever, which is a very long time. Indeed, the electric energy available to me there could light a fluorescent lamp, which it may be difficult to see, but that's all right. I assert it will excite or light the lamp. Yes, yes, I saw it. It's a little difficult in the studio with these much lights. Here is a tube called a spectrum tube. It is, uh, it contains some neon gas and it takes about 5,000 volts to excite this tube. I'm going to show you that I can flash that tube. Watch it. There it is. It flashed. It flashed. So, the electrophorus, that's what that is called, an electrophorus. First put together by the wonderful Alessandro Volta in Italy, Como, Italy. Now some more on these matters, adventures with electric chargers. I have here a Van de Graaff generator, and here I have a, a tube in which I'm going to put some cigarette smoke. Hmm, getting most of it in my eyes. That tube is filled with cigarette smoke. I'm going to connect that tube to this Van de Graaff generator which can supply me with a large difference of potential. Watch the smoke, watch the smoke. Will you just connect the generator for me, please, a moment? There, you see it, thank you very much. There was a precipitation of the smoke in this flask, in this tube, which suggests that the smoke was possessed of, made up of charged particles. Now I'm going to discharge that Van de Graaff because uh, it could be a little risky for me. Let me show you something more wonderful still. Here is a three-pointed uh, vehicle, like a lawn sprinkler. Notice the arms are bent at right angles to themselves and sharply pointed. I'm going to put this on the Van de Graaff. The system is at rest. And we will, in a moment, energize the Van de Graaff, and you will see an astonishing thing. We hope that little uh, uh, spin wheel thing will turn. Watch it. Let me have it, please. There it is. There it is. Turning. Thank you, sir. Notice, there was not much charge on this sphere of the Van de Graaff generator. Not why? because sharp points are good lightning arrestors or they speedily discharge the charge gathered, which tells us why lightning arrestors are sharply pointed. Consider this, which I call the mad professor's head. Some bits of paper. I'm going to make connection with the Van de Graaff. Every little sliver will acquire the same charge. And what should they do? Watch it now. Just a minute, hold on. Will you please energize that machine for me? Look at that, look at that. And notice too, thank you, sir. Notice down there, the field is so strong as to be felt at a distance. Let me have that once more, because I like it. There it is, I think that's wonderful. Thank you. I'm gonna try it once more. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to present my own head there and I hope you will see the hair stand on end. A little, please. Oh, yes, I feel it. Oh, oh, that's enough. Notice, we nearly had a disaster because I felt a discharge. One more matter. Here I have, notice how cautious I am. Here I have a candle flame and nearby it a sharp pointed rod and nearby it on this side, a spherical conductor. And I hope you see those very clearly. And I'm going to suggest the following. Here is the flame of the candle. There is the flame of the candle. 
thermal energy gives rise to ionization. There are then in this flame, produced by the flame, some positive ions and some negative ions. If I have the sharp point of a conductor, which is connected with the Van de Graaff, supposing there is an abundance of positive charges here, and this Van de Graaff is negative, do you see what's going to happen? The flame will be dragged over. On the other hand, if we uh, change the charge on one of these, the flame will be pushed away. I'm going to connect to the Van de Graaff and watch now, wait, wait. I have to make connection. I have to make connection. Here I'm making connection with the, with the rod near the flame. If you will energize that, please watch it. Oh, we had a little trouble, thank you. I had a feeling that the flame was pushed away, but we're in a little mechanical trouble, which need not fret us too much. Now, consider the following. Incredible device, a laden jar, dissectable, meaning I can take it apart. Metal insulator, metal conductor. I am going to charge it on the Van de Graaff Storing some electric energy in this vessel, if you will, please. Enough? I'm going to show you that there's some electric energy there. Watch now what happens when I connect the outermost and the innermost. Watch it. Oh, and there's always some more. There it is, and always some more. So, we have found evidence of storing some electric charge in that vessel called a Leyden jar. L-E-Y-D-E-N, Leyden or Leiden after Holland. Peter von Muschenbrock discovered this. Indeed, he had a shock which so stirred him that he said he would not take such another for the whole kingdom of France. Now, I want to show you something very remarkable about this vessel. I'm going to charge it again, please. Enough. Now I am going to disassemble it. There it is. I have disassembled it and connected all the parts. Would you not think that I have discharged the instrument? After all, I've connected the outermost and the innermost. Watch me now. I now assemble it. And now watch. Watch. Ho oh, ho! <laughs> That's a killer. That's a killer. I remember when I first saw this, 50 years ago, it puzzled me nearly to, to madness because I didn't understand it. And so I suggest that those students who understand this, they deserve an A in this subject of electrostatics. I'm going to do that again so you'll see that it's no fluke. Again, if you please. Thank you. Notice, notice. The greater the charge on the sphere, the greater the charge on this, and I feel the hair on my arm standing on end, and pretty soon I might have it. So watch, I'm going to disassemble it. I'm going to disassemble it. Notice, with absolute abandon. No, absolute abandon. Assemble it, outermost, inner, innermost. Watch it now, watch it. Aha, uh -huh. the energy is still there. And I want to know how it is that rascal works. And I do too, but from memory, he doesn't explain. So you can actually take apart a charged capacitor, bring the two plates together, discharge them, or seems to discharge them, reassemble the capacitor, and the charge will be there. Now, I have another one, a bigger one. This is a glass vessel which is coated on the inside with a metal uh, foil, so it's a conductor inside. It is coated on the outside with a metal foil, so it's just like that dissectable Leyden jar that I had a moment ago, but this one cannot be dissected. Uh, parenthetically, you notice I pronounce the word dissected, not dissected. It is not dissection when you cut up fishes and mollusks and cats and things. The word is dissect. Uh, and the word is also bisect, but not dissect. Watch me. I'm going to store some electric energy in this. If you will, please hold it. Hold it, hold it. Now, if you will, please.
I would say that's enough, thank you. And I think there's enough electric energy in here to knock down a horse. Watch. I'm going to connect the innermost and the outermost. Watch, watch, watch. Oh, mother! That is incredible. That is something. I would say that could knock me down once more, because I, I, it's very dramatic. Once more. Oh, hold it, Nelly. <laughs> I feel the hair on my arm standing on end. I feel my eyebrows beginning to tickle which means that I'm getting loaded with electric charge. And now watch the energy in this system. Incredible. Watch it now. Watch it. Oh! As we say, a beautiful... Oh, I'm going to be sure. A capacitor, a laden jar, uh, discharges exponentially, which means there's always some there, and one should never take a risk with it. Do you understand why it was that Peter von Muschenbrock, playing with these things in the 17th century, said, having taken a shock, that he would not take such another for the kingdom of France? So we have explored some wonderful adventures in electrostatic phenomena, and all we have done is a little work separating positive and negative charges, and a whole new world is exposed to us. And I thank you for watching. Professor Julius Sumner Miller in 1969, a very interesting series that was uh, put up on the net in several locations, not surprisingly, um, there is the Australian series Why Is It So, but unfortunately it's put up by the ABC and they defend their copyright very jealously. The American material is publicly available. While we're talking about Julius Sumner Miller, I should play an interview that was recorded with him towards the end of his life, about 1980, where he explains his rationale. He was a very interesting character. Julius Sumner Miller. Brought the magic of science to people of all ages. I am Julius Sumner Miller. I teach physics. The physics you see that I taught was down to earth so the man in the street could follow it. Men of science are given to the view that their stuff is too esoteric, too high in the clouds for the man and the woman on the path to understand. But physics has always been for me a sort of a homely thing. You see, children are endowed abundantly with curiosity. And I'm grieved to tell you, as Einstein said, the schools destroy the Holy Spirit of curiosity. To put it in a phrase, boys and girls are emerging from every level, at every level, with diplomas and certificates and degrees who can't write, can't read, can't calculate. This is scandalous. And fortunes are spent. And the claim of the schools and the school officers is we have been, uh, uh, we don't get enough money. I can do better with less. I could have a very good class under an apple tree. Don't need a classroom, maybe a blackboard. As we left his El Segundo home where he is ready and waiting for his next television series, he left us with this thought. If every day you learn one little single thing and you live 70 years, would you not have gathered up a handsome body of knowledge? Which has been my ambition all my years. To convey a body of knowledge which when added together, little piece by little piece, in infinitesimal accretion, layer by layer, would, that, would not this do something for you in all your years? And now, photography without lenses. Photography in three dimensions, and not only three dimensions, real images being produced. The birth of holography. One day we may see holographic television, but it'll take an awful lot of bandwidth to achieve this it. is a hologram. Holograms have little in common with traditional photographs, except that both use film.
holograms can create completely three-dimensional pictures, and every piece of the film can reconstruct the entire image. In order to understand holography, you have to understand something about waves. When waves meet, their effects are additive. When two crests meet, we get an increased effect. But when crest meets trough, their effects cancel out. This interference effect is important in holography. Here are two random sources of waves, not of equal amplitude or frequency. If we make a time exposure of their shadows, the image is completely washed out because nothing remains in place. Here are two pure wave sources of equal amplitude and frequency. Notice the areas of motion and calm in the water. A time exposure looks like this. As long as the frequency and amplitude of the two sources are constant, an interference pattern will be formed wherever they cross. These two speakers send out pure sound waves of identical frequency and amplitude. The microphone records areas of calm and motion. If we could see the three-dimensional interference pattern caused by the two sound sources, it would look like this. Light also travels in waves. What happens when two light beams cross? Interference of light waves should produce bands of light and dark, but we see none. In general, when two white light beams cross, no visible interference pattern is produced. A red filter will help to make the light monochromatic. Even this highly filtered light, however, is not monochromatic enough to produce a noticeable interference pattern. Let's examine the light source. While our water and sound waves are in step with one another, the light bulb produces light of many wavelengths, which are not in step with one another. This is the inside of a laser, a source of intense and spectrally pure light. The laser emits light waves more monochromatic than any filtered light source. We will use a laser to check for interference by passing its light through this optical device, which splits the beam in two. The interference should appear as bands of light and dark. Here is another demonstration using laser light. A partially silvered mirror allows half of the light to pass through while the rest is reflected. Where the two beams of light cross, we will place a film. Notice the camera has no lens. It is simply a film holder. This will be the path of the light.
the film looks blank. But watch what happens when we remove the beam splitter, leaving only a single beam of laser light. I'll just interrupt that there to say this is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima with the regular Saturday night test transmission to be followed by QSO on 147475 in exactly 10 minutes time. Uh, that is at 11.03 p.m. we'll open up on 147.475 for a callback and then following that, after about 20 minutes of that, we'll open up on Zoom for uh, a callback internationally. Hopefully we'll have a few of our regulars from America and uh, New Zealand. VK3, Alpha Mike Lima, back to the holography demonstration. The film reconstructs the original two sources from only one beam. How did this happen? Within the film emulsion, areas are exposed as light waves move through. Where the wave fronts cross each other, the silver emulsion is exposed. The developed emulsion is essentially a thick diffraction grating. Here is a microscope view of the processed film. To understand holography, we can think of the developed layers within the emulsion as a set of microscopic, partially reflecting mirrors. This film was exposed with two beams, interfering with a third. Now, by passing one beam through the film, the two other beams are reconstructed. If this car were illuminated with a laser, every point on it would reflect some laser light. This is how a hologram is made. Part of the beam is used to illuminate the car. We'll call this the object beam. A second beam, called the reference beam, shines directly on the emulsion and interferes with the light reflected from every point of the car. The exposure must be made on an absolutely motionless surface. Even the slightest vibration will ruin the hologram by smearing out the interference pattern. We will expose the film for about 10 seconds. The film looks blank, but through a microscope we can see interference patterns which bear no resemblance to the real car. Now, when the reference beam alone shines on the processed film, an identical image is reconstructed. Here is an explanation of what happened inside the emulsion. The reference beam from the left interferes with each reflected light beam from the car, creating an interference pattern. The emulsion simultaneously records all the patterns caused by all the points. Now, when the reference beam alone shines through the film, each pattern reconstructs its own object beam and thus the whole car appears to be reconstructed. What would happen if the emulsion had been here, between the source and the object? In this case, the interference produces what is known as a standing wave pattern.
These are standing waves. Therefore, if the light shines through the film and reflects back from the coins, there will be standing waves of light set up in the emulsion. Laser light will shine through the film and reflect back from the coins. An ordinary white light is used to view this hologram. Why does white light reconstruct this kind of hologram? A cross section of the emulsion looks like this. White light approaches and passes through the film. The mirror planes are spaced to reinforce only the wavelength used to make the hologram. Because the film shrinks in processing, the green color of shorter wavelength is reinforced rather than the red. Here is another white light hologram. When a laser shines through a hologram and onto a screen, a two-dimensional image is projected. Even a small fragment can project the entire image. Holography is an efficient data storage medium, which may soon outdate traditional microfilm. Here is a two-channel hologram. Two scenes have been recorded at different angles on the film. The channel is selected by tilting the film. The lens in the holographic reconstruction actually works. This is the principle used in microscope holography. A slide is placed in front of the final element of a microscope. Later, movable lenses will be able to act with the lens in the hologram, allowing us to selectively focus on any point within the slide. Through holography, structural flaws can be seen in solid objects. The dark lines show a stress pattern. By aligning the real object with a hologram image of it, a tap of the finger can be shown microscopically bending the steel. This circular hologram was made by surrounding the object with a strip of film. there are an increasing number of practical laboratory applications of holography. Here, the effects of heat are made visible. Even very subtle heat effects are clearly visible.
holography is in an early stage of development, similar to that of photography a hundred years ago. Yet already artists have found in holography a new medium of expression. Holography. Photography not only in 3D, but that you can look around the back of. And that courtesy of the Internet Archive. This is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. VK3 AML. With the regular Saturday night test transmission this week on glass and optics, photography and holography. <clears throat> holography which may one day, we hope, become a, a potential television medium if they ever have the bandwidth. As they increase screen resolution, 2K, 8K, 4K, 16K, whatever, one wonders how many K will be required before even a small hologram of what is at the far end can be transmitted. I believe that they can do holograms now in full colour, and that holograms have been made sufficiently large as to look as like a window looking into a room. There's a, a local artist uh, born in Brisbane, I believe, but resident in Melbourne, Paula Dawson. She's the same age as myself, born in 1954. And she has done some of the most magnificent holographic work of the last 30 or 40 years. Um, got into it very early at the time when the inventor of holography, Dennis Gabor, was still around. And uh, I remember at the Museum of Vic when I was there, 1984-85, I was uh, an assistant to the curator of electronics and photography, Jeff Holden, who had been seconded to the Story of Victoria exhibition for Victoria's 150th birthday, 1984. And uh, it was proposed at one stage that Paula Dawson, I think it was, uh, should be contracted to photograph a series of three-dimensional models of the buildings of Melbourne, say taken, reconstructed from prints that were made back in 1838 and again in 1848, 1858, and that the multiple images be stored in a big hologram which by moving around you could see one model dissolving into another to show the growth of Melbourne. Never came about, apparently it would have cost a small fortune, particularly in the size of hologram that was being suggested, which was something like a window into a display that was about a metre square. That would have been a very impressive display. I don't think it ever came about, and I'm not quite sure whether anything has been done like it since, but it was a very interesting uh, suggestion. That being said, I'll now set up to take a call back on 147 475. So, have we got any listeners out there? VK3 Alpha Mike Lima calling CQ on 147 475 and standing by. VK3 ACZ. And VK3 ECG. I'm not sure whether we have an audio feed there. Could you try again, please? VK3ACZ and VK3ECG. VK3ACZ. Uh, hello, Peter. Lovely to hear you there. And very sad about Gary Cook, um, 3GLC. Um, ECG. And hello to VK3ECG and welcome back from from Britain. Um, nice to hear you there. So we'll take Peter first, VK3ACZ and the group VK3AML. Yeah, VK3AML in the group, VK3ACZ. Good evening, Chris, and a special good evening to Dave. Good to have you back. Uh, been thinking of ringing missing persons. Hi, hi. No, all good. Um, about the broadcast first, uh, Chris, thank you so much for leading with the story about Gary. I um, 
Uh, I sent uh, Michael, VK3CMC, a text message to say that there was a, a, a moving tribute to Gary at the start of your broadcast tonight. He was a, a close friend of Gary's. I'm sure he'll be touched by uh, your kindness and all that as well. And uh, when I uh, originally emailed you about with the uh, sad news, I, I think I said then that I'd only met him when we were up at One Tree Hill. Uh, that wasn't true. Um, he came to a couple of club meetings, and silly me, I remember the first time he turned up, I said, uh, I know you're from somewhere, and I can't think where. And, of course, it had only been a week or two before uh, uh, up at One Tree Hill. Oh, dementia is wonderful. Uh, you keep meeting new people. Uh, but anyway, no, uh, very sad and uh, very sudden, and um, uh, there aren't any words, so there just aren't any, but uh, you covered the subject very well. And probably the highlight I take from tonight's broadcast was the heart beating in the chick that was 48 hours old. Um, absolutely wonderful to see that in the old black and white. Um, Professor Julius Sumner Miller, always good to see him again. So uh, very enjoyable broadcast all around. And just quickly to tell you what I've been doing today, I, I had to hurry to be back in time. I've been out portable, the Oceania DX context design, and I've had an absolute ball with my little 818. Um, I've contacted a heap of new countries with it on 20 metres and Malaysia on 15, but Belgium, Czech Republic, Hungary, uh, Japan, USA, Louisiana uh, and Wales, to name uh, a few of the countries that I exchanged numbers with today on 5 watts. Absolutely wonderful. Oh, and another message for, for Dave. Uh, I uh, went to the toy shop uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, just to get a $9 connector and uh, would you believe it, an IC705 followed me home. What was the man to do? Took it out the very next day and spoke to Mike Zero Zulu November Kilo is my very first contact and it's very funny I'm grateful that I recorded the contact because when I said working five watts he started laughing you know he thought that was uh, fantastic and uh, uh, we were both impressed by uh, my very first contact with the 705 uh, it's not going to be a favourite compared to my 818 for sentimental reasons but anyway uh, back to tonight's broadcast I better hand it back to you Chris VK3 AML in the group VK3 ACZ yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, well, we've had a um, similarly event-filled week, quite apart from Gary's sad departure. Uh, I, uh, on Thursday, met uh, Mike VK7MJ, my collaborator, Mike Groth, my collaborator on the uh, light beam communication systems uh, at uh, Spencer Street. He came... Um, down from Brisbane where he was visiting his grandchildren uh, by air and then took Skybus into uh, Spencer Street, met him there we headed home on uh, the train out to Blackburn and then the bus oh no, not the bus, actually Prue picked us up from Blackburn Station and um, I interviewed him today for the better part of half an hour just before he left to, to head back to Tasmania where he lives down at uh, Margate, south of Hobart. Mm -hmm. And um, so next week I'll have a half hour um, chat with Mike talking about his various activities. He uh, originally worked a bit in the mining industry. He had a period teaching in Papua New Guinea. Um, after that, uh, a period in Brisbane where he was the nuclear medicine officer for Brisbane General Hospital, then moved to Hobart with his wife, um, did a similar job at the Hobart General Hospital and then decided to change career direction, did a degree in environmental studies and became the atmospheric, uh, one of the atmospheric chemistry monitoring officers for the Tasmanian Environment Protection Authority. So he's had quite a checkered career. He did his PhD at the University of Otago, Dunedin in radio astronomy. I think he said he was the, the first and only graduate in physics radio astronomy from University of Otago. And his particular subject was radio uh, emissions from the planet Jupiter, whistlers produced by Jupiter's immense magnetic field. And he'll say a little bit about that on the video interview that I shot today. 
when we see him next week. So, Dave, you have a lot to tell us. You've been half a world away for a significant amount of time and come back. I think we saw you on one occasion via Zoom uh, from Britain. You might care to fill us in on, on all the things you saw, or at least some of them. VK3CG, VK3AML and the group. Yes, VK3AML and the group, VK3ECG, and a good evening to you, Peter, as well. Um, I'm glad to see you have seen the light and, uh, and acquired the, uh, the 705. I must say, it is uh, now the weather's getting a little bit better again, I'm going to uh, get out and about a bit, although um, I have been pretty busy. Um, so I was away, as you, as you pointed out, uh, Chris, for quite some time, and I did manage to join in, on, as I said, on one occasion on Zoom but, uh, and, and listen in, but unfortunately the particular time slot um, uh, translated across the UK meant that um, I was catching up with my brother um, on the Saturday when he came over to see my mum, where I, and I was staying with my mother at the time, so we, it tended to be a bit of a sort of a, a family time slot. Um, so I wasn't really able to do um, uh, very much um, uh, in terms of uh, radio or Zoom and things like that. Um, all, all was well, however. Uh, my mum, who's uh, um, 88 now and is a little frail, but um, uh, did reasonably well. And we were about to go travelling and, um, uh, and then she caught COVID. Um, <laughs> she'd hardly really left her flat for the last two and a half years, but I managed to get her out and about and managed to get her to acquire COVID. The only good thing about that was that she recovered very quickly and very well, actually. And um, although she said it was very unpleasant, um, uh, the vaccination obviously helped her enormously. And she did extremely well, um, which was, um, you know, a, a great source of comfort in a way. Um, having spent the entire... Uh, time with her for the whole week she was sort of infected in this tiny flat uh, I got um, no symptoms <laughs> uh, well I'm, I might have had a minor sore throat one day but I actually I certainly was not unwell at any stage um, and I suppose that's not to be um, uh, it's not really unexpected given that um, uh, my vaccination level and I'd also had COVID about uh, two and a half months before so um, uh, that was a, a good sign that I, I could get exposed like that. I probably had a subclinical infection, I, I imagine, uh, with, with just symptomless, and probably has just boosted my immunity again. Um, but uh, but there we are. Um, on returning in um, the first part of September, I, um, I, uh, I, I haven't been able to get out and about and doing much radio stuff because I've been... Um, flat out catch up with all the things that people have tried to get me to do while I was away um, and uh, had a bit of fair bit of um, sort of teaching things to catch up with and then the last couple of weekends I've had concerts so I've had a couple I've been singing in concerts um, uh, actually both of them were in the same place actually different choirs different occasions but um, both of them in the Hawthorne Town Hall mm. um, which is a, uh, has been done up extremely well and uh, is a very nice venue. Um, so that was very pleasant. And um, but hard work and you know last minute rehearsals and things like that, um, and dress rehearsals and all those sorts of things that go with those sort of performances. And um, uh, so it was a it was a very busy time. Um, and uh, I've literally uh, really only turned the power back, back on in a, in a shack in the last in the last week um, and started getting things all sort of sorted out again. Um, but there we are. Yep. Um, so certainly uh, fascinating tonight. I really uh, really enjoyed that and understanding how um, the glass is, is made and washing the glass. Uh, um, the, the, the skill set is, is enormous. I I did travel to Venice once with my wife and we um, we went out to Murano, the, the, the glass island, uh, where all the coloured glass and so on comes from, and um, and watched them at work. <laughs> it was very interesting. And some of the elaborate um, coloured glass sculptures uh, at Murano are just extraordinary. Um, and they, of course, you do these tours and they try to flog you the glass. Um, and I knew what perfectly what would happen if I said what I actually did, because they they sort of tried to sell you the highest level. So I just said I was I, I was a 
I was a poor teacher and they left me alone very quickly actually they thought there was no money there um, <laughs> and um, but it was it was a really really quite fascinating watching them watching those watching them do those sort of things and the, the Prince Rupert's tears uh, with the, the tension is just so dramatic though I can't though seeing that being uh, being the the piece broken off the tail with somebody their fingers without any gloves or any protection at all I thought it was fascinating <laughs> probably the truth for the um, some of the other demonstrations uh, that we saw um, uh, you know glass workers were, were wearing any any sort of gloves or any protection had and bare skin exposed which I, I suspect is not allowed today um, so a few interesting things there um, I mean lens has always always fascinated me and and certainly in terms of you know, my work in microscopy, I spent, you know, um, I spent years and years and years looking down microscopes uh, and so on, and all the different types of uh, objectives and that we, 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 we had, and they cost an absolute fortune. I mean, you're talking, you know, just a, a simple little objective that screws at the bottom of a microscope that, that could be anything between, you know, $2,000 and $10,000 uh, for some of these things. And... Um, uh, and some of the sort of um, planner and poker mats that, that, that are around these days, uh, which have really got these sort of um, wide field, flat field um, correction lenses, with uh, which are designed so that uh, the, the different um, the different colours, the different frequencies, of course, uh, are, um, are co-focal. And it's it's really it's, they're really fascinating. But of course, the more flat fields you get, and the wide plan apochromatic uh, lenses you get are just extraordinary. Um, and uh, uh, and their colour correcting uh, uh, is 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 just fabulous. To be honest, you probably don't need it diagnostically that much um, if you're looking at it with the naked eye. But if you're certainly if you're trying to produce um, photography, um, it, it's certainly another thing. And of course, nowadays a lot of this is being done and moving towards it being scanned and getting scanned images sent out, uh, which is fascinating. Um, uh, it would be really interesting to see what would happen if you could really do some of the 3D stuff on there, but actually with my microscope slides, that's not, not really um, terribly important, although being able to focus through them probably is quite useful. Um, I was certainly very interested in, in um, the... Uh, in Mike's um, uh, interview, or the interview you do, did with Mike, um, that will be fascinating to hear about his experiences and, and so on. And I know you've shown some of the videos and, and so on before, but I, I certainly will look, look forward to that. Um, I mean, see if I know about his teaching the PNG. I, I've, I've been over to PNG a couple of times where I've um, done a, a take part in a short a training course and things like that. And, <laughs> it's a, certainly another planet when it comes to uh, uh, what goes on and uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the place. Anyway, Chris, back to you. Uh, VK3 AML and the group uh, VK3 ECG. Have we got any other breakers? VK3 AML. Oh well, we gave them a try. Uh, VK3 ECG, VK3 AML. Glad you had a reasonable time catching up with the family in britain but sorry it had to be locked down with covid and particularly with your mum getting it gosh that was a bit of a worry um prue and i either have managed to escape it by assiduously wearing masks when we're out or perhaps we've just been lucky or perhaps we actually have had it and our symptoms were so minor that we didn't notice because, of course, occasionally you have snuffles, particularly in cold weather, and it snuffles could be just cold weather or they could be COVID. You, you just don't know. Uh, it appears that with each of these successive waves of COVID, the next one is less severe, less fatal than the previous, although people, I believe, are still dying. And, um, yeah, Mike um, had, I think, one year of teaching... Um, back about 1970 or 71 in Papua New Guinea and uh, decided it wasn't for him but one of the deciding factors was that his wife was having children or had had her first child and uh, the rate of infant mortality among white people living in New Guinea is so high um, that they were well advised to move back to more equitable climates 
without tropical ulcers or any of the tropical diseases that could afflict a child to the point of death. So uh, they moved back down south, um, at least as far as uh, Brisbane was concerned. Mike's originally from Adelaide, incidentally. His uh, brother still lives over there. Um, what else can I comment on here? No protection. Yeah, looking at that glassmaking film, uh, the fact that they had a vessel with red-hot molten glass in it um, being carried on a single pair of tongs by a crew standing well back. I suppose they'd have to stand well back getting close to it. They'd be fried. Uh, but the fact that it was an easily smashed vessel so that they could get the outside off it um, indicates to me that if the tongs had been applied too tightly that could have smashed the vessel and they'd be standing in a sea of literally white hot molten glass um, <laughs> with all of these films of industrial processes before the second world war I, I'm continually amazed as you probably are Dave by the OH&S complete you know um, lack of care for any potentially fatal industrial process all being filmed in, in full gory potential Anyway, back round to Peter and once more to Dave and then at about 11.30, maybe 11.35, we'll try for uh, Zoom if nobody else comes up on 2 metres. VK3ACZ. And uh, glad to hear about your uh, contact with M0ZNK. I can imagine them having a bit of a giggle about the amount of power that you're not running. But if you have a quiet location and a good antenna, and I know you do, even for portable work... Um, Five watts of sideband will get you there, particularly 20 metres and up. VK3ACZ and the group VK3AML. Yeah, VK3AML and the group VK3ACZ. <coughs> and I might add too that my best contact today was Latvia on 10 metres, uh, but more about that in a moment. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, response to your uh, being fortunate about COVID. Yeah, I suspect it is a good luck rather than good management, but uh, I wouldn't complain either way. Um, I got it because Sandra went to a birthday party and, and the um, birthday person gave it to most of the folk that were there. So it's, um, yeah, you never know your luck in a big city. Um, another word about Gary. I, um, if I indicated that I didn't know him all that well, well, I didn't know him all that well, but spoke to him often on air, in fact, he even chose me one day to do some uh, 10 metre testing. The fact that I was only six kilometres down the road probably didn't uh, matter much comparing signal strings with antennas and all that. Uh, but there's an eerie feeling about having watched him on the screen, on the Zoom screen last Saturday night. And I know people go rather quickly uh, and it takes you by surprise. It's probably no different to when it's long drawn out, but uh, I'm, I'm still reeling from the shock. I, I just wanted to say that. Mm. Um, and I'm going to miss him too. And um, uh, Dave, in response to the 705, um, uh, Chris, I needed to mention that uh, I was there watching um, uh, Dave uh, playing with his 705 one day on that um, F-Tom-inspired meeting at Columbia Park. And it didn't actually prompt me to uh, pick up one, but I'm getting such a buzz from QRP operations at the moment and building up a list of countries and signal strengths and all that uh, it's just a lot of fun. Um, 20 metres at the moment, you could work, uh, or in the afternoons between 2 and 6 p.m., uh, a non-resonant length of wet string will get you uh, five nines um, from Europe. So it's, it's um, I wouldn't say losing its appeal, but it's not quite uh, the same as when it's all new. And QRP's given me that added little um, buzz that I get from it all. And just to give you, Dave, uh, a hint of what you can expect if you've not been out portable or not been playing much on HF, uh, 15 metres has started to come good. Funny thing is the solar flux has been in the 130s for a while and I would have expected better conditions than we're getting. Mind you, I do listen to the IBP beacons a lot and I can hear at least half of them on 2015 and, and sometimes even 10, but still no signals. I do suspect that it takes a contest to get uh, people out on the air that the, 
the propagation paths are open, but hardly anybody's working them. But, uh, yeah, 15, um, I've had um, Sweden at uh, about uh, 9.30 at night, uh, which is kind of surprising, so much for it being a daytime band. 10 metres at the moment, Dave, is open around about sunset, and it can be really quick. It's almost like that sporadic E you get where the door opens and the door shuts. But as I said, I got Latvia the, this evening with 5 watts on 10 metres, and uh, that was a marvellous contact. But there's plenty to be had, and I'm guessing when the sporadic E season starts in a month or two, it's really going to be fantastic. But anyway, enough of all that. Back on topic. Back over to you, Chris. VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. Yes, very good. Um, VK3 ACZ and group VK3 AML. Uh, the Latvia contact on 10 metres sounds interesting. When 10 opens up, it's certainly... The signals are very clear and free from noise, at least in according to what I've heard direct. A um, couple of things have happened since you departed, Dave, too. Um, the EasyPal digital slow scan group, which has um, plotted along every Thursday night for the last hmm, 12, maybe 13 years, has suddenly had a bit of a boost because um, for years the JPEG file compression format was the uh, compression format, the go-to, the standard for the internet industry. Um, but a new format has come out as of 2019 called the .avif file extension. And that is a product of mathematicians and people with image compression knowledge getting together from about six different organisations, including Netflix and Google and various others, and producing an open source format that produces in, let's say, a 50K image file, something that looks like a 500K JPEG. So consequently, we've suddenly given this AVIF file type uh, we're able to transmit pictures of unprecedented quality and definition on digital slow scan TV that we've never been able to send before. And as a consequence, an increasing number of computer savvy young people, particularly, are joining the EasyPal digital slow scan net on Thursday. And the interest has been sufficient that the few amateurs in Ballarat who can receive the RML repeater have been reporting to their local club, club BARG, the Ballarat Amateur Radio Group, and they look like starting a second EasyPal net from the VK3RBA repeater, Mount Buninyong, on a Monday night. Uh, at least the committee is going to push for that from the repeater owner, who are Amateur Radio Victoria. So if that goes ahead, there'll be two... VHF digital slow scan groups exchanging pictures of humour, of technical interest and uh, just general shots of country trips by people on two different repeaters from two different localities, which is going to be an interesting development, particularly with young people involved who are very computer savvy and uh, know all the ins and outs of modems and HF transmission with multiple subcarrier. We 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 have an unprecedented influx of expertise in that area. So it's a watch this space situation. And uh, Peter, if we if we go up to One Tree Hill again, or perhaps in better weather, Mount Donabuang, I'll now be able to transmit pictures from Donabuang, say of the view back to Melbourne, um, back to Terry on the west side of the bay, for example which are of unprecedented quality using this AVIF file system. Anyway, that's one major plus. Um, there's been a degree of bickering too among radio groups, um, RASA versus WIA, the last few weeks. And uh, if it was over something really significant, like um, a debate on the amateur's right to build his own gear as distinct from type approval I might uh, say that it was a worthwhile debate or if it was about 
extra transmitter power, it would be a worthwhile debate. What RASA and WIA are at each other's throats about at this stage is the possible usage of, wait for it, the AX prefix for the Queen's mourning period. And to me, this is the proverbial storm in a teacup, the piss in the wind, and it just indicates the immaturity, I think, of some people um, involved with amateur radio. For goodness sake, get your priorities right, people. And I hope the people that are involved with this are listening because I am sure I'm not alone in taking that position. VK3 ECG and group, VK3 AML. Yeah, VK3 AML and group, VK3 ECG. A little pause there. I didn't hear anyone else, but um, I don't always uh, have the world's greatest reception from other areas here. Um, yes, that's the, um, I, I, I did catch a little bit of that, and I couldn't quite see what the uh, why this was an a, a issue of any great relevance I have to say um, and um, uh, in some ways uh, in that sense I agree with you Chris I mean either it's 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 a lawful process or it isn't and that's the end of it really if the regulations the regulations you follow the regulations or you decide not to follow them at, with their own consequences and that's the end of it so as I can see um, Yes, the easy power thing sounds fascinating. I've not really played very much at all with um, um, those uh, video transmissions. I, I, I did load um, easy power and got, I, I had problems running it actually on the old shack computer I had and uh, it just for, it was a fairly ancient machine and it just used to crash and I never worked out why. I, um, I uh, got one of my daughter's old computers back um, when she got a, a new one, and um, uh, and I had built this originally for her some some years ago, um, and while it's not up to date, it's considerably more modern than the old one I had. Um, and Easy Pound now runs on it, so I I've got no excuse to have a have a go and and um, uh, and try it out. Uh, I haven't as yet fitted the you know put anything together in terms of um, audio device coupling and things like that. Although I'm set up to. Um, and, I, and do it very, very occasionally, run and try FT8s and stuff like that, which has been successful. Um, so I'm sure that all the connections are there. I've just got to configure it and do the setup and, and so on to get it uh, to get it working. Um, so I might give that a go sometime. Um, yes, the um, I, I, uh, I think Peter, I, I've been just listening around the last couple of days, and things certainly are, have really picked up. And um, um, I haven't uh, been around at the right times to sort of pick up 10 metres. I usually do monitor it actually on the on the second frequency and I can uh, have a look and uh, and just keep an eye on what's happening on 10. And um, um, But I will obviously have to, uh, as Spradley Key comes up, it'll be interesting to see what, what, what sort of appears. But you're obviously having a, a great time there and fantastic to be able to get out and about and do those sorts of things. Um, as I said, I've just been, it's been freezing cold here and wet. And I've sort of, um, what were the other things I had on, um, I just haven't had the chance to get out and about. But I've got all my portable stuff all set up and all ready to go. And as I said, um, um, last, um, it's sort of, in, it's certainly I'm still operating and doing my portable stuff in the, aut in the autumn. Um, uh, obviously not while I was away, but um, uh, I'll get back to that now. Spring's in the air and um, it's getting a little bit warmer, so I've got my, uh, my bag, my, my setup, the 705's all, all uh, ready to go. I've got, um, I um, found one of those telescopic whips, the, the 17 foot ones, um, which means I can put a, a, a vertical in on, on 20, and of course 10 and 15 as well, um, and I've built the radials and everything, and that, I've driven that in the, in the ground and had a few contacts. Um, with that, which has worked really well, um, so um, I can set up a vertical um, uh, very quickly and easily, actually, um, without throwing wires into trees. Um, but I've also got the um, the wires made up as well. I've been playing around and constructing some bits and pieces, so that's uh, that's available. And um, we'll see see what happens in the ne in the next few weeks. It it should be good. Um, I think you're right. There's um, the conditions are probably better than it looks like when you're looking around the bands. Um, 
uh, as you say, as soon as the contest seems to be there, everybody seems to be out and about. And um, even uh, when um, you started this evening, um, uh, Chris, at so I, I, I switched on the uh, HF rig and there were plenty of US stations and, and, and odd European just sort of fading away, even that late in the evening, which I was quite surprised at. Um, on 20 so um, it, it is certainly um, uh, uh, certainly uh, the time period uh, where the, the long path is open seems to be um, longer than it was before I went away um, and that's certainly encouraging just it was it was very very sad to hear about um, Gary and um, and thank you for your, your your comments Chris I obviously we've spoken a little bit on this group and things like that um, uh, but I think probably the last time was in was in That's June right. or July, and um, I, I um, so the, uh, yes, that, that was uh, uh, no, that was tragic. You. And um, and uh, it's a nice of you to to um, speak so glowingly and so on. Um, uh, in terms of uh, what else uh, I've been up to, um, well, not much in the way of sort of constructing things. Before I went away, I was sort of still doing some stuff and things on antennas, but. Um, I have played around with um, building some bits and pieces on QRP and uh, I still have this sort of grand aim of getting my um, Morse up to speed a bit. Um, uh, certainly I'm able to transmit okay and my, rec my receiving is just a bit too slow. I just need to get much more instinctive. Um, uh, I did it all at sort of it was 10 or 12 words a minute. Um, well, I think it was 12 in the UK you had to do it at um, uh, when I had my... Um, license there but I really haven't used it much since so I've played around building a few bits and pieces and um, with any luck I can try and get my uh, morse up to um, a speed of it and that would be quite fun to have something that's really very very portable and small to do uh, that sort of thing anyway back to you VK3 AML and the group VK3 ECG VK3 CG in the group. We now have Tom George on uh, on Zoom. Can you hear me, Tom? Hang on. Can you hear me, Tom? Have you got audio there? I think you've muted yourself. We're now operating on Zoom, people, and we've got Tom in Ballarat. Yeah, I'm here, Chris. I had the muted because I was still receiving on... Uh on the uh, stream. Right. And the audio was going to get back, so I've now muted the stream, so... And there's Rolly, Sidil 1BQD in Auckland, where it's currently 11, 12, 1.40 a.m. Boy, Rolly. <laughs> <laughs> you look a little pale, Rolly. I hope that's not due to us. <laughs> How are you doing? No, I'm doing all right, thank you. Right. Anything new happening in Auckland at the moment? <laughs> no, just rain, more rain and more rain. So uh, mm -hmm. there it is. But uh, I have been doing a lot of um, uh, mobile work lately uh, out in uh, some of the parks and uh, uh, with the uh, parks on the air program, also the uh, um, WWFF program um, with the New Zealand uh, FF uh, program and uh, uh, mainly up uh, north of Auckland so there's quite a uh, quite a lot of parks up there around that way up towards uh, the top of the North Island so I've uh, been activating all the uh, parks from Auckland north put okay. it that way. I must admit I've never been north of Auckland um, I never went to Bay of Islands or what is it Cape Ringer up the top um, and Cape I'm, Ringer. I'm mm. told that it's extremely pretty up there and uh, my wife has been out to the Bay of Islands by ship, but but I've never been. There's some nice trips around the islands, yes, out up there, that's for sure. And um, it, it is pretty, hmm. but uh, midsummer can be awfully dry, though. <laughs> All right, right. Hmm. Now, Tom, um, I believe that... We, were you at the <laughs> committee meeting for BARG? Hello, oh. Dave. Um, were you at the committee yeah, meeting? Yeah, I'm in the... I'm in the committee... And uh, last Friday night, well, last night, we had the actual uh, general meeting. All right. And uh, the request was received very, very well. Good. That's what for easy What you might even find is that, um, yeah, and what you might actually find, you'll have quite a few uh, listeners on the side when it does start. 
right. just receiving. I know there are quite a few up here, and you do too, that are ready to go on transmitting. Great. So um, our secretary is just going to send the appropriate letter off just to be of courtesy to let them know what's happening with uh, RBA two metres. Okay. And uh, I don't think we'll have any problems. So uh, when that arrives, we'll uh, give you the okay. Great stuff. And is it likely to be Monday night, as suggested? Yes, yeah, Monday night seems to be a good night because it doesn't clash with any uh, any nets or anything like that. Good, good. And um, so, no, it was, was, was very well received. We had um, didn't have a great deal of turnout at the, at the general meeting, mainly because of weather and things, but um, uh, even talking on air about it, um, yeah, very, very well received. And, and a, lot, as a lot of people said... Um, some use for the repeater too, because I can listen to RBA on I can listen to RBA on two meters all day. Yeah. And apart from myself and Peter PWG and a couple of others that are on for about two or three minutes, it's it's <coughs> it's uh, basically dead quiet. Yes. Um, I'm sure you could find a, 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 a time. Yeah, when it's, it's the UHF one. The, yeah, it's the UHF one that gets the most work because it's um, IRL, IRLP linking, but. Um, uh, uh, the two meter, the two meter one, um, yeah, no problems at all, and I don't think there'd be a hassle with getting uh, getting permission, mate. No problems at all. Yes, yes. Uh, Rolly, in New Zealand, do they have repeater linking on the same basis we have on on UHF, uh, multiple repeaters across a long distance uh, to get large areas covered? Yeah, yeah, there are, and there's some uh, cross band repeaters as well. Uh, from uh, two meters to seventy centimeters, and uh, then there's what they call the national national link up so yeah it, uh, it's all linked up on uhf i believe yeah but um you you're not asking the right person about uh, anything about uh six meters here oh oh okay <laughs> you, you're an hf man basically yeah yeah but uh, uh all my commercial life was uh, uh you know, vhf and uhf with satellite linking and all that sort of stuff and uh um, uh, but uh, so uh, I had my fill with all of that sort of stuff uh, professionally. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I found that when I was working at the museum, um, the last thing I wanted to do was to work on anything technological at night. So all of the ham radio. Well, next, hobby... t- next time you cross, uh, next time you pop across here, well, I'll, I'll take you north of Auckland up to the uh, the Walkworth Satellite Station, and that's oh. uh, that's. Uh, yeah, that's really worthwhile. Um, in fact, I was involved in installing that many, many, many years ago, and that's when we had to have uh, liquid nitrogen to cool the waveguides, put it that way. Right, and, uh, right. Actually, um, on that business of oh and uh, earlier today, uh, Mike Groth and I were watching a film of a lecture recorded in 1965, or filmed in 1965, by mm. William Lawrence Bragg, who was well known for X-ray crystallography, but he was also a magnificent lecturer on kind of the same basis as uh, Julius Sumner Miller, um, a great showman. And right. um, in this lecture, he was showing how some gases are paramagnetic. They have very mild magnetism. And he did it by mm. pouring liquid oxygen over the... Yep. Um, the poles of a a, a klystron magnet or something, magnetron magnet. And um, I... And watch it curve. Yeah, Yeah. it actually adheres to the two pole pieces and sticks between them like Mm. like iron filings, except boiling, of course, at normal room temperature. Um, And I said to um, Mike, look, he's, he's, he's doing this without any hand protection at all. And Mike turned to me and he said... You can actually put your hand into liquid nitrogen <laughs> and it yeah, feels right. warm. And as long as you don't do it too long, um, yeah. because the, yeah. the, the stuff actually goes to gas around your right. hand with the heat of your hand. Yep. So it's, it's yep, like yep. a trick that's done by uh, science lecturers to shock their students, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> well, what are well, we. Sci- we handled uh, liquid nitrogen in bulk, and with uh, I don't remember taking all that many. We just, uh, I don't know, you just sort of get a bit au fait with it after a while. But, yes, uh, well, Dave, it can be, be it can be hugely dangerous. I know. But, oh yeah, yeah. Dave, Dave would know the physiological effects of that. Dave, being a, a, um, a, a what do you call it, a, a coroner. 
aren't you, Dave? Yeah, well, no, not really. But uh, can you hear me, by the way, or not? Yes, fine. Yeah. Unfortunately, oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're going out on two metres, and you're going out on on oh. on uh, uh, well, live stream. Live. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I can just I can just hear it. Yes, it was breaking up actually two metres uh, earlier on, but it's better now. Yes. Nice. I mean, it's very. I mean, in liquid nitrogen is is. Uh, used therapeutically quite a bit actually but obviously for skin lesions and things like that quite common um but yes this effect of actually getting it to uh um uh, vaporize um, um uh, from the heat of the hand creating a insulating layer of gas mm. um i don't think i'd still like to rely on it for no. too long <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because it's still extremely cold air and i think if it, you had um, any circulation problems <laughs> liquid nitrogen would find those areas very quickly <laughs> i think that's right exactly mm. so <laughs> yeah you you can do a similar thing with your wet hand and lick and uh, molten lead oh, oh really yeah. yes the yeah. mythbusters did it um one of them took the uh, took the plunge and popped his hand mm. in and out of molten lead and uh yeah the same thing yep. this time it's the water um oh, yeah. that, that, that goes to steam and causes the, the barrier mm. for Just a while dip, 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 dip back out again <laughs> oh, yes. dip in dip out the brain will well, probably not let you leave it in there mm. <laughs> it's like the bushfire thing we're about saying you know in bushfires don't wear wet clothing and try to keep yourself cool because what happens is you basically seam yourself like a like a dumpling. Um, yeah. uh, uh, so it, it, it's not safe at all. Actually, dry what, dry clothing is the way to go. What fascinates me is uh, who was the first guy you thought, oh, I'll wet my hand and I'll shove it in that, that molten lid. <laughs> no, just give it a go, you know. I wonder what will happen. Yeah. This is the difference between applied between theoretical physics and applied physics, isn't it? Maybe it was yeah. the world's uh, the world's most unsuccessful attempt at suicide. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. That, that was the that's the uh, the perennial or the suicide trainer, isn't it? Now yeah. follow me, guys. I'm just going to show you this once. Perhaps we yes. shouldn't talk about suicides. <laughs> Dave has too yeah, well, much experience of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, that's the way it goes. Yes, yes. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting. I've been up. I was up in um, in the in the Birmingham area. I was a few other pieces and things like that, but uh, um, not not too far from Callum's um, halls. In fact, very close to uh, mm. the DX Commander uh, oh, right. part of the world, as it happens. <laughs> right. Right. You were, you were mentioning Papua New Guinea earlier on. Uh, mm. uh, I just I just came late to the uh, to the party on that one. Um, was one of you spent some time up in Papua New Guinea? Is that uh, right? Not for long. I was only I was only there for sort of a week at a time, um, running a, oh. um, courses. Uh, uh, but it was just a really fascinating, such a different, you know, uh, experience culturally and and what's going on. And oh yes, that's, oh <laughs> that's that's me from Papua New Guinea. Right. Yes. Okay. I didn't really. I have to say, Which I one? didn't oh. really. Yes, been up the there, uh, been up there a number of times. Mm. Um, probably, mm. oh, you need you need two hands and a couple of feet to count how many times I've been up there over the years. But mainly up to the, up the north, uh, northern end, up uh, Wewak actually. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I suppose most of my time was just Port Moresby and the sort of major centres because uh, it, it, that's where the teaching was was grown from. But it is just sort of, it is quite fascinating. I mean, uh, um, not more is where first. you want to get away from, though, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I was there for, on one trip, I was there for about five or six days. I think uh, someone was shot outside my hotel on the, on the first day. Ooh. A ship blew up in the harbour on the second day. <laughs> someone apparently was kidnapped from the compound next door on the fourth day or whatever. Um, so it was a bit like that. And when you... Um, and when he walked out, walked around, we went to a market, a group of us, and we were being followed. Um, you know, it was quite quite interesting, and there were quite clear guidelines of what you do um, if you're you being don't followed. Do that. You don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Not uh, in Fort just, Moresby. We wax it. We wax okay, a bit different. But mm. even even when I'm up in we you know, uh, and the, mm. the guy, the people know me around town now, you know, because I've yeah. been there so often. Uh, even then, I'm. Uh, I always take uh, at least mm. two or three of the of the real big boys with me yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, from from the radio station, 
And if I want to go into town, mm. two or three of them will accompany me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because they've actually got a um, they've got a magic act uh, legislation, the Magic Act, which actually makes um, uh, the use of magic a criminal offence. Um, and it's it's really interesting because it amounts to what in English law would be like the common assault, that is putting someone in fear of immediate harm, which is a sort of definition of assault. And yep. um, and they have the same process for black magic or for magic. Um, so if you actually put a spell or curse on somebody, the fact that they feel or they believe that it will hurt them and harm them is sufficient for it to be an offence. And I remember going to one of the courts because I was doing, that's where my sort of teaching thing was, was structured. And uh, um, there was all this sort of weird um, staining stuff over the steps going up to the court. And I sort of said, oh, well, you know, what's that? And he said, oh, I think they've just had a witch doctor here. This is the main court in Port Moresby um, who yeah. has poured uh, some, some um, um, potion on the steps to ensure the outcome of the trial that they want. Or they have, that the person is higher than wanted, so it, it's it was you know it, it's real and a very practical issue, which I've, I've it found is very real. I, I yeah, I go out to some of the villages and so on like that, and the first thing I look for mm. in the village is the is the house that has the roof which slants down to Both. the ground. You know, uh, yeah, up, uh, that, that's where the wish doctor uh, yeah. is yeah. Uh, resident and. Uh, Mm. Uh, it's quite tangible. Uh, on the odd occasion, you feel the back of the hair on your neck go sort of up like that, and you get a cold creep down your back, mm -hmm. and you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I got a I got accused of stealing one time when I was up there. These uh, oh, wow. boys uh, came came out of the bush, uh, dressed mm. in all of their feathers mm. and finery and so on like that, and they, they can stop you in your tracks pretty quickly. Uh, even mm. that. But the, the problem was, um, I would apparently it was had taken all the copper out of the wire. The, that um, the, because the gas the gas line that the Australians and Americans had put in it sort of went down past their village, and uh, they, they have uh, comms wires up and down that follows up the down the gas line. Well, um, the Australians got sick and tired of replacing all the wire all the time, so they changed it with for. Um, fiber optic cable yep. yep so i got accused of stealing the <laughs> copper out of the wire oh, which they wanted to make. i mean the the, ir the irony is it's so thick it, it, it took me all my time to, to yes, not to is. laugh and uh, and yeah. uh, you australians and mm. i said oh hold mm. on hold on um <laughs> i come from new zealand <laughs> that would oh, be concerned i said and I said, yeah, uh, do you know about the All Blacks? They go, All Blacks? Oh, <laughs> oh, you knew, oh well, welcome, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so from e anywhere I go now in Papua New Guinea, mm. I always wear my T-shirt with New Zealand written across mm. it or New yep. Zealand across the cap and so on like that so yep. that I'm not not confused for being Australian <laughs> or American. Oh. Uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> my, my, uh, my cousin's um, daughter married a chemical engineer for one of the major uh, petroleum companies and after being popped around the world different places he was offered a, part, a place in Papua New Guinea and um, they gave him a house nice house in a compound and everything else <laughs> they got used to living in a compound um, yeah. but the one thing surprised him was why he, he never saw his boss on the weekends <laughs> and it seems his boss had his family in Brisbane and the company paid for him to go home on the weekends. Right. Yeah, that'd be true. Um, they didn't mm. stay there all that long. Um, no. It was, it, it, it's, it's, did you say, it's a bit tense as to what you do. As long as you stay in the compound, you're right. But you, there's a yes. thing oh, you yeah. get trapped. You yeah, stay in the compound. Or if, you, yeah. if, if you're going mm. to do any wandering around, make sure yeah. you've got some really big boys mm. with yeah. you that you know and yeah. can trust. Yeah, well, uh, was, uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the normal rule uh, or normal rule of law up there is let's have a good old biffo, and uh, <laughs> then we'll just then after the biffo and everybody's is all uh, bandaged up and cut and bruised and bloodied up and so on. Oh. No, mm -hmm. well, we better talk about what the issue was, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, I was always told yeah. that if you do find yourself outside the compound or whatever, is make your way to the nearest sort of general store supermarket because they were all fenced in, or you know, with, with the with the 
mesh on the fence and a couple of large guys standing by the door with big sticks. Yeah. And you go yeah. in and, and then make your phone call from there and um, get, get range to be picked up. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's for sure. I mean, I took my wife up to uh, WeRack uh, last time. I was, well, one of the times I was up there. She'd never been to Papua New Guinea and so on like that. And uh, we went into WeRack and saw the, actually saw this guy running down the street with obviously contraband under his arm mm. security guards after him like that and everybody just stepping aside and yeah. oh, girls girls said why doesn't somebody stop him you know <laughs> said, yeah. if, if well, you're well, the one that if you're the one that stops him the uh, first thing is the uh, the security guards are going to beat you up because uh, you're showing them mm. up for not doing their job yeah. or the crowd itself will beat you up because you're taking the side of the security guards, <laughs> and, and so you're on a you're on yep. a case to uh, you can't win yep. this one. Absolutely no, not. There's no, no way to win it. So you just step aside yeah, and uh, let it roar yeah, past you. And uh, mm. yeah, yeah. Were you there yeah. doing radio work, Rolly? Yes. Yeah. So doing uh, putting in uh, uh, radio transmitters. You know, FM transmitters. Uh, mm. There's a uh, in the order of. Uh, or minimum kilowatt up to anything up to 10, 15 kilowatt okay. uh, transmitters. I, I remember the, listening uh, in... Right the throughout the FM broadcast band. Mm. Uh -huh. in, uh. in the 70s, I used to listen on about oh, 4.9 megs or somewhere about there to... Yeah, yeah, all that short... Uh, in fact, all that shortwave infrastructure is still there. And it is, okay. Really, just needs to be turned on, and uh, it well, might go. <laughs> mm. But uh, amazing how much of the infrastructure is still there, that, but not being mm. used now. It, I, uh, I remember uh, listening to the pigeon, <laughs> mostly in pigeon from memory. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of it's in pigeon, and uh, a lot of it is in English. But uh, pigeon mm. is the is a standby because you see, you've got something like about eight hundred different tribal right. affiliations, yeah. and mm. within yeah. the, each of those language groups and then you have uh, at least three or four dialects or something like mm. about two and a half thousand different dialects so yes. there's no way in which you can uh, learn them all or speak them all on the radio yes. mind you everybody everybody walks around with one of these things up in <laughs> in all of the islands will have mm. an fm um receiver built into them mm. as well mm. and like like you have in australia and you, i'm not sure about australia you have fm receivers built into your cell phones or not some. No. Um, um, yes, some. I have, but you've got to have the earphones. Yeah, well, see, in, in, yeah. in New Zealand, uh, well, I'm not sure what we have, but uh, every every man and his dog has got a uh, has a cell phone, and uh, they mm. just go and put the yeah. chip uh, put a chip in and pay their money every yeah. so often and a few keener and, and that ear yep. earpads in and where they go. Mm. I mean, that's yeah, the weirdest. That's weirdest the contradiction language. you can get when you go out into a village and they're all dressed up in their native finery mm. with a pair of earpads on, earpads yeah. in, their, in their cell phone. <laughs> it's fascinating. The language thing is really interesting because, I mean, when I was, when I went there the last time, I was there um, to do with the magistrate's court and the chief magistrate, who I knew because he'd been over to Australia quite a few terms, he and his wife don't have a common PNG language. He's from the Highlands, he's from the Lowlands. They have Ooh, the only language geez. they have in common is English. How did they get together? Well, <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, interesting. It's not, normally the never, never the twain shall meet. That's right. Oh, they were, I think, outside that tribal component because they were, yeah, you know, they trained that overseas have... and stuff like that. So, oh, you'd but, have but to be. It's, yeah. How wid yeah. widespread is HF as a receiving medium in Papua? Is it? Definitely a thing of the past now, Rolly. The the what? Sorry, uh, HF. Is, is HF broadcasting oh. a thing of the past there now? Yeah, very, uh, yeah, fairly much right throughout the Pacific now. There's, uh, I think, there's still um, uh, Far East Broadcasting Company. I think they still um, uh, produce some uh, uh, religious programming on shortwave, but uh, they'd be probably about the the only ones left now. They took over from. Uh, HCJB from Quito, Ecuador. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Heralding Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus blessings. blessings. Yes. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And they, they were in uh, Quito, Ecuador. Well, when they stopped their shortwave service, then I think the Far East Broadcasting Co uh, Co uh, Corporation took over, 
and um, mm. uh, with the, the short wave type stuff. But there's very little uh, HF um, uh, broadcasting around the Pacific now. I suppose like the, small, the countries, uh, Riley, it would be, it's easier to get coverage with um, VHF, FM and so on than, um, uh, and with, with the, the, the quality, because you haven't got a really large geography, have you, to cover. Although I suppose there'll be hills and mountain issues that are, require in well, some uh, places. If Papua New Guinea is a terrible place yeah. to try and cover yeah. with, uh, with uh, yeah. any... Uh, uh, FM broadcast. I think uh, sure. when when uh, when God was creating this place, He had all of the earth left over and said, "Well, where can we put this?" and stacked it up in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the HCJB. There you go. Uh, I remember yeah. that well. I've been there a couple of times on that place. Uh, oh yeah, fine. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah, that's been a while. Yeah. Um, so so uh, uh, yeah. Um, the other problem is with HF and um, broadcast and, so, and sort of shortwave broadcast is nobody's making receivers nowadays for mm. the, to yeah. cover those bands. So mm. it, it, it's almost um, it, it, it's a tail end of what digital uh, yeah. uh, digital AM, uh, FM and digital yeah. AM is sort of mm. experienced here in Australia and New Zealand now. Mm. Uh, um, nobody's prepared to jump because the broadcasters don't want to broadcast it in because mm. nobody's got a receiver, but nobody wants to make yeah. a receiver because nobody's yeah, broadcasting. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we, we're in that circle. Do you jump in and go, right, this is what we're going to do? Because once it, once it gets going, it'll take off uh, reasonably well. Although mm. um, we've done some experimentation actually with DRM here in uh, New Zealand and because uh, mm. uh, it's also most of New Zealand is stacked vertically as well. So, uh, um, again, yeah. uh, you know, with anything that's digital, uh, it's fine until you until you get the, a, a dropout. Yeah. But yeah. Unlike yep. a unlike a normal AM dropout, where you can still it's amazing yeah. how how much your ears can still hear something. Yeah. With digital, sure. it's yeah. It's yeah. I mean, even, off, even and then back even on and then off. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, even in my QTH on DAB, I mean, going down mm. the high street in in Warrandyte, um, I will lose because of the of fourth hill. I'll just lose everything, and you get a couple of little interference patterns as you come into it, yeah. and then you come yeah. out of it, and a big gap in the middle. And it's only for a, only for a, probably two hundred meters, but it's down I mean, by so, the river. So, so would argue. Some would yep. argue that's the beauty of AM. I mean, you yep. get a pretty crusty signal, but your ears yep. can still. Um, that's right. Yeah, still, still, sort of work it out. I, I would have thought that, from yep. the point of view of the South Island of New Zealand, particularly Rowley, that those sort of dab broadcasts would be a real problem because you've got reflections off the mountains, you've got valleys which are inhabited, the mountains and not um, mm. places like Alexandra and 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 those sort of places up in the mountains in the South Island would be particularly difficult of coverage. They're bad enough with television, for goodness sake, let alone dab. Yes, it is. And, and it's, it's yeah. always a difficulty. I mean, we have, uh, we have a number of um, uh, stations around. Of course, uh, the, the company that I was um, looking after or looking after all the technical stuff for years ago, um, the distribution method we used was via satellite. Mm -hmm. So we would, uh, from Auckland here, we'd throw everything up onto a satellite. Then whatever yeah. the satellite whatever the satellite can see, well, now you can put up a, um, yeah. uh, a dish and get off the satellite uh, in a very sort of remote village even uh, and cover the whole mm -hmm. village, rebroadcast locally on a local frequency. Yeah. And that's and that's the uh, way in which we do it here in New Zealand yeah. and I think most of Australia as well. And mm. you've got mm. you've got um, DRM broadcasts on short waves still from uh, Radio New Zealand, haven't you? I'm not quite sure whether that's the case. Um, uh, I'm mm. pass. No, yeah. <laughs> that it seems yeah, a lot of a lot of countries have tried it, but not many have stuck with it. Um, yeah, the, that's correct. I mean, Germany, uh, uh, the Germans have done it well, and they they seem to have it working well we had a crew in fact that's uh, doing this trial these guys came down from germany uh, to trial it we put it on one of our our frequencies in wellington and uh, so we uh, we had the transmitter doing drm as well as am 
simultaneously oh. off, off the one transmitter. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, it was quite fascinating because I had a little transistor radio in my top pocket. Just listened to AM, you know, because we hopped in this bus and went around, all around Wellington and all around, the, just just to see what the DRM... Now, when it was there and we could hear it, it was just like CD quality, mm-hmm. beautiful mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, but as soon as we went under a under bridge or a, uh, a, under a, a mountain got in the way or something, like that, it's it's gone. Yeah. So I'd pull out my little transistor radio and go, "Well, I can still see, still hear it on AM." <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yep. that annoyed the Germans somehow. What, I don't know why. What surprised me when I was listening on one of the web-based SDRs to broadcast in India. In India, mm. virtually the whole of the AM band is DRM. There's no, there's, there seems to be very little analog left. Um, oh, mm. meeting is ending in ten minutes. Well, that is a warning. <laughs> We've got to do something about this. I might actually fork out the. Oh, what happened? No, nothing. Yeah, um, you're still there. I've got a screen. You're oh, still there. good. It just flashed Sorry. up a blank screen. Um, uh. Oh, uh, DRM is excellent, but uh, uh, of course the, the other nice thing about DRM is you can have multiple uh, multiple channels on one frequency. <laughs> so all yeah. of a sudden now, um, I mean, AM uh, frequencies, of, uh, all our AM frequencies here go to auction every so often, and you've got mm. to bid for them, and of course yeah. they're relatively cheap, but uh, if DRM took off, all of it, and you had a whole lot of AM frequencies, mm-hmm. you're sitting on a gold mine, to be okay. honest. Yep. Because uh, you know, if, all of a sudden, the frequency, people will want the frequencies back, and then they get multiple, multiple channels per frequency. There's mm. a question I'm burning to ask you, Rolly, uh, and it's one that started me off on Medium Wave DX when I was 10 in 1964, and that is <laughs> that we used to be able to get 2YA Wellington because it was on a clear yeah. channel and they were running some fantastic power like one or two hundred kilowatts or something. What happened mm. to 2YA? Where's it gone? I got no idea. No idea. The NZBC it's cut it. it back or something or, or, or what? Yeah, probably. Um, uh, it'd be fiercely expensive to run that sort of power nowadays and, uh, uh, and for what for what purpose, really? When you got the same coverage mm. with uh, FM, yeah, yeah, at at a far better quality. So yes. yeah. uh, it's it's just simply died a natural, I believe, Chris. But right. I, I'll check mm. that out for you. Yeah, mm. it but used that, to be the strongest station that we could receive on medium wave from New mm. Zealand. Yeah. I think it was on about. Uh, it, interesting, you said that as a young kid too. I mean, I, I was I was a little seven year old underneath my blanket, set in bed. With my little crystal set pushing yeah. around, and I heard HCJB, and I thought, oh. that's interesting. Quito, Ecuador. Now, yeah. and, and we were in, we were living on the farm in Taramanui, and, that, and that's Taramanui's right in the middle of North Island. Right. But I dare not ask my dad where Quito, Ecuador was because he knew what, he'd know what I was up to. So I <laughs> went, de- went down to the went down to the guy down the bottom of the farm and I knew he spoke on radio and he's a, he's a ham radio guy. He said, Quito, Ecuador, that's in South America. And I said, is that somewhere by um, by Hamilton or something like that? And he said, no, no, no. And, and he got a globe of the world and showed me where it was. And I was like, mm. you're joking, really? Yeah. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah. He says, uh, and that started my amateur they, career. They did have very strong signals. I believe mm. that they were trying to get a, a transmitter going up near Wyndham in the northwest of Australia for a while. In oh, fact, yeah. Anthony, VK3JA, a friend of mine, was going to do some voluntary work for them. I don't know what ever came of yeah. that. Um, but yeah, 2YA was on something like 560 kilohertz or something just below 600 kilohertz. And it was on the, r- the correct end of the broadcast band yeah. and with the power to cover the whole of New Zealand. And part of Australia, yeah. obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously, mm. obviously. Mm. Yeah. No, there would be interesting in there how, how I don't know. Is it progress, uh, guys? Or I, I don't know, but certainly things change, don't they? Rapidly. Well, it's a pity because <laughs> medium wave DX used to be really interesting when the ABC stations who occupied mm. most of the lower end of the broadcast band used to close down at either midnight or one a.m. It would leave the whole band there free for us to do DXing and that was really we, exciting. 
We mm. got a tremendous amount of mail when we closed down one of our AM uh, frequencies. This is from the Rima Broadcasting Group. Mm. And uh, we closed down one of our radio stations that was on uh, Mahia Peninsula down by Gisborne. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, we just started getting this mail coming in from all around the world, particularly Can- uh, Canadians, apparently, mm. okay. saying, uh, what's happened? We, we can't hear your station anymore. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> and they're, use, they're using that. Uh, that was only a, it was a five kilowatt station, but, uh, yeah, the closest at to- the top end of the top end of the broadcast band. Uh, when, when yeah, I-, I suppose also the, the sorry, costs sorry. of, um, sorry, I'm just saying the cost presumably of running those things, uh, those AM stations and so on, so much higher than probably putting in multiple VHF um, systems and uh, they presume they're much more sort of uh, almost prefabricated in a way rather than having to be tailored or designed and yeah. uh, and with large-scale construction. I know that there's right. a trend in Australia to close down AM stations and replace them with FM or to move people mm. off AM to mm. FM, but... From the point of view of country listeners, frequently it does prejudice yeah. against them yeah. badly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, it's the same uh, same argument here in New Zealand too. I mean, uh, I'm on I'm on the board of the Rumor Broadcasting Group and so on like that, and it, it almost comes up every board meeting. You know, mm-hmm. we've got what are we going to do about these AM stations? Because some of them mm-hmm. are getting very old now; they're uh, mm-hmm. you know, 35, 40 years old. And you either maintain them, and uh, maintaining the uh, the antennas yeah. is is a huge cost. Huge maintaining the transmitters is is getting almost mm. impossible to get parts for some of them now, especially yep. some of the old uh, five kilowatt Harris transmitters. Mm. And mm. Um, so, what do we do? Uh, do we uh, do we maintain these things, or do we whip them out and put in the FM? And of course, um, yeah. um, the rural areas of New Zealand would no, they, they would uh, I, I think we'd have a huge backlash if we uh, whip out the AM stations that's for sure yes. I think you'll find the same with the rural Australia as well oh yes <laughs> yes yeah. yes. yes there are parts well, the well I mean the, the, the distances here are vast particularly for the mm. inland um, even greater than New Zealand uh, the mm. one thing I do notice in going around New Zealand with a number of voluntary stations community stations I did a tour of one at the fair... I'm just trying to think of the name of it. It was a historical village outside uh, Christchurch near the entrance to the tunnel that goes through to Littleton. Um, oh, yeah. I'm just trying to it's think It's a of, fairly, is it? Yes, at the, the historical village. They have a voluntary station running mostly vinyl. They have a massive library of vinyl and volunteers, they open the station on a Friday night and they close it on at the end of the Sunday night. So the volunteers... Yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit of that sort of stuff, uh, community radio. Because community radio is um, uh, alive and well in New Zealand. It's meant to be uh, uh, limited, uh, you know, uh, very limited power, but yeah, <laughs> some, pe- some people don't quite get their dbs correct but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The, the other station that i saw a little no. bit of was southland radio in invercargill which really yep. was uh, they're very enthusiastic about it there but it doesn't get through to stewart island unfortunately so places like stewart island mm. if they got rid of am they would really be in in difficulties mm. i don't think there are any broadcasters mm, on stewart uh, yeah and you do have, and, in those places, you have that feeling of isolation that you really like to break down with a decent broadcast service. Just yeah. talking to the I people. Mean, so increasingly, I presume, it's a, it's a satellite downlink systems, isn't it, then, then feeding into VHF that's sort of providing a lot of those remote access now. Yeah. But, it's, mm. but that presumably has a higher expense, I suppose, if you're doing it that way. We've got 90 seconds, fellas. You want to say oh, anything right. finally before we close? <laughs> no, I'm fine. Have, have a good week, Chris. Yeah, and oh, do, do stay in touch, Tom. I'll come on the will, Ballarat mate. repeater sometime between now and Monday and we'll see if we can find out more about what goes on. Yeah, I'll th- uh, I'd say Malcolm, our secretary, will probably be putting a letter together over the weekend. So okay. Is it likely we'll be running a, a net on Monday or will it be sometime further I down the... I don't know. Maybe the next week. I don't know. Okay, we'll see. Uh, depends how quick they reply. You might even email them. Yeah. 
yeah, um, good. to find right. out. So um, we'll just have to wing it at this stage and yeah. see what comes back. Some great developments in digital slow scan in, in Australia, Roly. It's, it's interesting to watch it happening. What was that, 317? You poor he... man. I feel so guilty. <laughs> oh, no, no, there's some, no, there's some jolly good DX on uh, 15 metres at the moment into Europe. Yeah. Europe is oh. wide open on 15 metres. You're yeah, not disturbing good, anybody yeah. in your house or anything by being on? No, my my wife is way up the other end of the, as long as I don't go CQDX too it, loudly. It's the same thing here. My wife's down the other end of the house and she's probably slumbering in but, front uh, of the TV set. <laughs> but, but, uh, Thanks for coming uh, on. Most anyway. of my stuff at this most of my stuff at this what? time of the day is uh, is the old diddly dash, you know. I mm-hmm. see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of money. Right, guys. Well, listen. I'll, I'll, right. I'll say it. Uh, oh, there it goes. And we'll switch back. I actually have facilities at the moment to switch to uh, the main camera, which is there. And hello again. I'll switch off the zoom camera. Um, and thank you to that. Pardon me, hiccup. Thank you to the people that came on Zoom. Uh, very much appreciated, especially Rolly, who's burning the midnight oil and then some. Um, I'll take a final listen on two metres and I guess we'll wrap up. Uh, VK3 Alpha Mike Lima now um, calling on two metres to see if anybody's still about and standing by. Yeah, VK3 ACZ is still about. Yeah, absolutely. Here, yeah, Chris from VK3 CG, but I will be back soon. Uh, we are clocked. Of course, can we change? Everyone remember that at two o'clock. So uh, <laughs> back to you. Oh yeah, it's the end of it's the end of daylight saving, isn't it? Um, that's going to be quite something. Just hang on a sec. I'll get rid of Zoom and um, your free meeting has ended. Get unlimited meetings and more with Zoom Pro. I wonder what that it would cost if it costs more than a hundred bucks a year i certainly wouldn't go for it um and i think probably 40 40 minutes is enough although you know you get some interesting people that are not in the service area like uh, tom in ballarat and particularly roly in auckland and last week i think there was uh, or the week before there was uh, clint from salt lake city who i know from actually having visited Salt Lake City uh, years ago, 2008 and incidentally um, uh, when I was in Salt Lake City um, just referring to what Rolly was talking about I was taken to a clear channel station, a high power AM station called KSL Salt Lake City commercial station big one, I think running 100 kilowatts or something and they had analogue AM up to 5 kilohertz from the carrier and then from 5 to 10 kilohertz it was a digital signal um, carrying another program or it could have been the same program plus one other I'm not quite sure but um, there certainly is a plethora of systems around VK3 ACZ to take and I suppose we'll wind it up very shortly. VK3 AML and the group. Yeah, VK3 AML and the group, VK3 ACZ. I would have liked to have joined that Zoom meeting, but you didn't give out the um, a passcode and the and the uh, other numbers. Uh, I don't know what it is. I, I'm, I watch your broadcast on my phone, and it doesn't have any of that side information that I presume uh, the others were able to get to uh, be able to join in. But still, it was uh, fantastic listening. I, I tell you what, I, I didn't uh, lose too much. A couple of things came up. Uh, the mention with HCJB. I know you got their QSL card, and I uh, listened to them a lot when I was a uh, oh, 10, 11, 12-year-old too. Sounds like we had a similar start, Chris, with listening to... Um, medium wave dx and, um, my understanding with them is that uh, well, apart from the fact that they ran an absolutely brilliant signal they were uh, by far the loudest uh, strongest station i'd ever hear on uh, the short wave bands but my understanding is that um, uh, radio australia's uh, uh, transmitter gear went up to Kununurra for HCJB, of which they pointed all north. And the last time I looked, I don't think they even do any English broadcasts uh, 
more's a pity, but it was wonderful when it was coming across from uh, Quito, Ecuador, and all the more reason why I was thrilled when I got my first Ecuador contact on 40 metres uh, one evening. Um, now, what else was I going to say for the... Um, uh, now, that'll, that'll probably uh, cut me out, I think... Uh, Another a good evening spent uh, in front of the radio. Chris uh, enjoyed your broadcast as I always do, and uh, good to have Dave back, Dave back, of course, as well. And um, oh, interesting, Rowley said there's lots of 15 metre um, Europe coming in at the moment. Uh, well, they're two hours different from us, but uh, I must uh, go and have a look. Uh, I know I worked an Israel station at 2 a.m. on Christmas morning on 15 metres. Uh, the conditions have never been as good as they were last summer, but they're, they're slowly picking up. And as I said before, Dave, um, 10 and 15, the switch has been flicked in the last couple of weeks and things are really improving. Uh, I'm hearing uh, now Dave in Birmingham, what's his, I can't think of his number, it's either G4 or G0 FWX. He's on most evenings on uh, 28 490. So if you want to contact the old country on uh, 10 metres, um, there's a thought, round about sunset, but be quick. Um, and uh, there was one other thing. Oh, that's right. Chris, you said something about um, uh, we're going back from daylight saving. Don't do that or you'll be um, an hour or two late wherever you're going. It's uh, We're going to daylight saving, so clocks go ahead. And uh, thank you for the reminder or I would have forgotten. Um, I'll make this a final. Um, good night and cheers to you both and any listeners. VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. And as always, thanks for being there, Pete. Um, it's nice to hook up on this weekly basis. Um, and uh, I agree, the Zoom chat went particularly well tonight, mainly because I shut up. <laughs> I realised I could finally take a break while the others had a chat, and that was really nice. Um, so that uh, um, I think that's an indicator for future occasions. Um, the other thing is I've got all three webcams going. Um, I'll just hold up the mirror. Um, the Brio is a dirty mirror, but you can see the Brio there. That's that oblong thing with the light on the front indicating where to look. Um, so that's the Brio that's the main camera for the for the uh, live stream then there's this one that looks at the zoom screen and then there's the zoom camera so that the guys on zoom can see me which is there so uh, c930e c930e brio um, we finally got the <laughs> the whole system working but it's taken three webcams to do it Anyway, with that, round to Dave VK3ECG, and thank you also for your input, Dave. Very much appreciated. Just as, isn't it regrettable that, that Gary uh, is gone? It's just, um, it makes me realise that uh, that old saying applying to people of our generation, do it now, uh, very much applies. VK3ECG, VK3 AML and Group. Yeah, VK3 AM in the group, VK3 ECG. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a, a real truism, and uh, uh, everyone sort of think and needs to think about that. Um, yes, I can't quite work out. Um, I'm. I was also monitoring on my um, on my phone, just switched on, but I can see the um, the live chat with the Zoom meeting details there, Pete. I don't know whether uh, I'm just using uh, an iPhone with a with the um, with the uh, YouTube app uh, rather than the, the, than the, um, the web page. Um, so maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a bit easier with the actual app uh, for, for YouTube, but I certainly have got all the live chat things there and that's where I got the passcode and the Zoom meeting ID from. So uh, um, uh, yeah, I don't, don't know, uh, perhaps, you're, perhaps you're looking at a, at a browser and you couldn't get it on the screen or something. Um, but, but there we are. Yes, I, I, I'll just quickly scan at 15, and I, ha I can hear the background noise there, um, but I, uh, I can't see any signals on the scope, and um, tuning across, I'm not hearing anything on 15 at the moment. There's still, there's still a few bits around on, on 20, um, interestingly, and, um, uh, and uh, I can't see anything at the moment on, 
I wouldn't expect to see much on ten anyway. But uh, but uh, but with the contest on, you know, there's quite a lot of round on, uh, still a bit, quite a bit of round on forty and things like that. So uh, um, nothing much else at the moment. But uh, so maybe New Zealand's got a, a slightly better uh, uh, thing for the US than we have tonight. Um, mind you, I, has, I don't have beams or anything like that. It's just just uh, long wear multiband dipoles here, so uh, that's all I've got. Anyway, I'll have a little explore. Um, Chris, thank you very much at the Easy Power, and I'll have a little look at um, doing some wiring and bits and pieces there and see, see what might work in, at some stage in the future as a little project. I'll say 73s, everyone, and um, thanks very much, Chris, for, for fascinating stuff on the glass, and uh, look forward to um, uh, things next weekend. Uh, so nice then everyone and uh, have a good week. Cheers from VK3 ECG. Dave, that's what it'll be, the YouTube app. Thanks for the tip. Uh, 73 and good night guys. Yes, yeah, seventy threes, fellas, and thanks for coming on. Just a final call. Is anybody else wanting to make a comment before we close? VK three AL Alpha Mike Lima. Not a peep. Anyway, um, I'll uh, catch you next week and uh, then we'll have that interview with Mike VK7MJ. Runs about half an hour and there's some other material uh, related to that interest too, relating to the um, radio emissions from Jupiter and uh, the role that the moon EO IO has um, in moderating those transmissions it was a subject of part of uh, Mike's thesis plus some anecdotes about his early days with amateur radio in the 60s and that'll be next week okay uh, this is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima concluding the regular Saturday night session and we'll be back at 9.30pm next Saturday night which will be the 8th of October well that's my mum's birthday she would have been she would have been 110 a silly thing to say <laughs> anyway all the best fellas VK3 AML clear and to the people on the stream I hope uh, the videos were of okay quality along with the audio um, I had a little bit of trouble with uh, audio levels varying about tonight but uh, I think they were within spec I also had a little bit of not hum but some sort of funny circulating earth effect on my two meter transmission so um, that was very odd so this is uh, Chris VK3AML wishing you all the best until uh, until next week when we'll have some original interview material to play good night people and have a good week cheers <laughs>